Um, you have been active since 2001, and I actually went back in time and found some of the very, very first things that you did in, in the space. Um, yeah. You had been here for less than two months before you insulted Carmack the first time in a comment. It was mwah, it was it was beautiful to behold. People don't know these things, mate. Like, like I, I actually, what's funny is there's one time I revealed some of this, which is when I was at an event. I can't remember who it was. I think it was like the Score Esports or something. They were doing this feature, right? Which is a cool feature, but they, they weren't able to execute it very well. Where it was called like My Demon, and the idea was each pro player was supposed to say like you know another pro that was his rival, you know, his mm. nemesis. So the problem with that is they really under misunderstood that most pros aren't going to have like a cool storyline like that. Like they're just going to think. I just play the other players, you know, like, it's not really going to be like a movie. Whereas what I said is I said, well, because they asked me if, I, if, I, if like, there was any, like, they could do an interview with me. And I said, what you should do is do that feature with me, because I'll actually tell you, you won't know it, but my nemesis was Carmack, and we're both just idiots on a forum, you know, like a quake forum, like, <laughs> 18 years ago, but obviously now it's a sick storyline, isn't it? Because he's like the head of IEM. I've done pretty well in my own field, and obviously still both bastards to this day. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So let's um so let's dive into that um since 2001 till 2019 i wouldn't even begin to you know ramp up everything that's happened and like the amazing evolution of esports is esports today where you f could have imagined it would ever end up being no i like i always get really really skeptical of people who try to claim that they knew like where things were going to go or they have like some special faith because i would consider myself someone especially with all the things i've learned over time i have a pretty good read i think on like how certain elements of the industry the mechanisms that make it work like the concepts that you need to improve if you want to make it bigger etc and quite frankly a lot of the, like I, I don't know if you've ever there's like a very famous book where it's about like the nature of scientific revolutions and the basic premise of the book is that you would think, because science is supposed to be based on maths and physics and stuff, you would think it'd be gradual. Like, you know, one guy, like evolutionary, one guy does like X, and then the other guy does X plus one, and the other guy does X plus two. What you actually tended to find was the nature of these scientific revolutions was like someone just comes out of nowhere with something that changes the whole game. It's a paradigm shifter. And the idea is, beforehand, you can never predict it. There was no build-up, because the whole point is, logically, if anything had implied that, someone might have done that already. So you have something that works, and then someone brings along the new thing that makes that, like, just get that out of the way, let's start with this new thing. So to me, within esports itself, it's not like it's just one thing, it's had that many times. And then, crucially, it's got that weird theme that goes parallel to it, which is because the business world has to interact with it to get it as big as it's been. Well, we've been on the unfortunate end of, like, during my time alone, like, two crises of, like, dot-com bubble burst, the reset global recession and as you might expect spending a little bit of your marketing budget on some video games is going to be the first thing you go ahead and slash from that budget when your boss is trying to fire people from the office you know so i get it but i i always think people just like to kind of like when they look back they think what would be a really cool story if i said like oh yeah i always knew that was gonna happen yeah oh yeah it's like you really sound really sick if you said so i would just say this in the early days like, it wouldn't have mattered how big it got. Like, maybe for the first 10 years, I was just a purist. I just loved the actual games I was watching. I genuinely, like, I, I'll give you a great quote, okay? Even in 1.6, a lot of fans eventually got bored of, like, some of the teams or whatever. And they were like, oh, it's always the same teams and the same maps. We need, like, variety. And actually, me and Funny Enough Lopez, who also was kind of like a purist back then, we both used to just say it. That just shows how different a purist and a casual can be. Because I'm not joking. If I could see like Fnatic versus like the Polish team versus like SK Gaming on these five maps forever, I'd lock them in the arena and just bring in food and pump in the air. You know, like I'd watch that. Is that good? So for me, it didn't matter if it got big at the time. I mean, to be fair, it's convenient because I didn't make that much money myself. So I didn't have. I guess I didn't have raw skin in the game entirely. Although I had sort of tanked my whole. I don't life into it. There's that, but whatever. <laughs> exactly. Sort of. So what I would say on that one is, like, initially, I just thought, I just hope it's cool. Like, if it has to get bigger, I was always asking, if it gets bigger, do you compromise something? Like, I'll go ahead and tell you, when games like League of Legends came along, part of me started to think, like, is this even the business for me? Like, if this if this is the one big game now, StarCraft 2, which I think is a whack version of StarCraft Brood War, and then League of Legends, which is a crap version of Dota, if this is the future... Like, maybe it's time I'll go find it. Maybe it's the future for someone else, and my future somewhere else, you know. So, luckily, there was able to be the thread of, like, some hardcore games or some of the strategical elements I enjoyed. So, I think it's more like in the last decade where I saw the business side, and as it got bigger, I think maybe because of some of those resets I referred to, I think it almost, like, 
chopped away the fat each time. And it meant that by the time we got to now, we're obviously now it's really the catalysts there to be huge. I think it's somewhat done it in a reasonable fashion. Like you still got really serious. You still got Counter-Strike at the top. People would have told you back in the day, just like all of us Quake fats who after two years were like, when's Quake coming back? Never. I tell kids now, you think Quake's coming back? I've been asking that for 15 years, mate. It's never coming back. Just give it up. That's like the guy went out to this, you know, your dad went out for cigarettes when he was seven. He's not coming back, is he? With a poppy. He's gone. Let's get over it. So, yeah, I would just say, like, I never saw anywhere close to this. And that's because I could never have foreseen all the crazy things that happened. Yep. Um, and one of the things I've been thinking about is that esports is truly a product of technological evolution. Um, and as that progresses and that sort of, like, changes culture, right? This very fabric of society, yes. how we interact with each other. Um, when I look back, <clears throat> I would argue that esports have literally always existed right on the cusp of that, right? I yes. see QuakeNet was like on, arguably one of the first social media networks in real time <clears throat> where you had profiles, you would, you would come online at night, you would talk. It's basically become what I think Twitter is for most people today. We had that, you know, just a decade ago just for the, for the gaming scene, right? It's, it's amazing to think of. Dude, the wildest ever, I always tell people this, is this just shows you how some of the early pioneers in esports were legitimately like genius level. Because I always tell people, oh, you're impressed with Facebook, are you? BDS invented Facebook about three years before Mark Zuckerberg, and it was better. It was coded better, features were better. Like, the guy actually did it. I mean, what's mad is at the time, he didn't know if he held out for like five years, he'd probably be like a fucking billionaire right now. But it, it really, it's true. Like, the tech was there. That's the thing. You're right. It was always people on the cutting edge of the tech. Like, even some of the people, like the guy in Quake World who made like the Quizmo or whatever, where it was basically like the equivalent of you could view the game inside the game. Yeah. So you had no latency. That, man, that was like as good as all the uh, Go TV and stuff now. It was insane. So, like, there's a great quote that people often say. They say that culture is downstream from biology, as in, like, you know, humans' yeah. biological yeah. demands and what we do. Culture will always come as a result of that. I would say in the 21st century, culture is downstream from technology because technology is what shapes how you think, your paradigm of the world. And, like you say, like, there is no YouTube, so why are you going to put the videos? Like, you remember back in the day when those guys, ODB, used to go to those CPLs in the early days? They would just put a file on an FTP server, and you had to just download it for like six hours. Like, that's not a very consumer-friendly <laughs> experience there. You're never going to get your dad to download that, are you? It's, yeah. it's too weird. So, yeah, there was none of the tech, pretty much. It was just basic websites. Yeah. I remember in, in CPL winter 2001, we were sitting in Dallas. My team had been knocked out. We took seventh, I think. And um, I think it was it, but I'll let you get away with that one. <coughs> nice to see you again, Dr. Uh, <laughs> so oh, no, actually, you're right, you did. I you, know, oh, you're right, because that was in the song. Yes, it's when DOP let you play on a map you actually knew, and therefore you beat them, <laughs> so you got one spot higher. You're right, yes, my apologies. But it should have been on, like, Clan Miller. You should definitely have lost that game. So yeah, I'm glad you gave them a shout-out in that song, mate. They deserved it. They gave you money for free, basically. I should have given a bigger one to... Uh, uh, to Heaton and the boys, actually. Do you remember the finals at CPL Berlin? Um, the rule said, this is early days, right? So the rule said it had to be a DE map. So yeah. the one DE map that no one had played for, you know, about as long as the beta now had been out was those, Dust 1. We were all playing Dust sure, 2, right? Yeah. So yeah, in the final, Snip uh, had, had the you know, higher seed. So they chose the map to start on Dust. We were just like, what? <laughs> we didn't even have a strategy for the fucking map, you know? They sure. did. They did. Ooh, they did. <laughs> of course, yeah. <laughs> uh, the good old times. That actually, one of the things that I miss, and, and now I'm just being an old fart, but um, maybe you can tell me where I could find something that would give me the same thing today. When we would go to tournaments back then, usually we would have practiced, we would have prepared, and we usually had found, you know, at least one new way to shoot through the roof of Nuke, or sure. something that no one has just ever done for, right? And if it worked, great. We're off to a great start. If not, hey, whatever, you know. <laughs> but every time, someone would try something new, right? So before all these tournaments, all of a sudden, he Heaton and Party would be sitting in the corner on top of each other. Like, all these crazy things happened. Do you feel like there's still the same level of like, like development? There's still like that level of, of, uh, of exploration? I would say generally no, because like you said, the difference is if you were a top team back then, you could come every tournament with something new. Like you could really, and crucially, it would be new. Like it's not like, you know, oh, the other people in Sweden know it, but the Americans don't know it. It's like nobody knows it. That's the whole point. Now, there is like two factors that seem obvious there. One is, I know this is actually one of this, the like hidden threads that a lot of fans don't know about the legendary StarCraft player Boxer, is when Boxer first became a top pro, there actually weren't replays in StarCraft Brood War. 
So if he did some amazing stuff, you had no idea what that was. It's the first time you've ever seen it. Whereas the whole point is, like innovation back then basically was the premium because you could get everything out of it. Whereas what happens now is you can innovate something, but then immediately that you do it, everyone else sees it, everyone else starts copying it, implementing it. And now you have to not only be the innovator, but the guy who perfects it as well. Because otherwise, like if someone else scores and takes your thing and they're a better player, well, good luck, you just gave him a weapon to destroy you. So I would say like that's one reason that you can't be the same way, like you can't sort of hide it the same way. And then the other thing is, the only thing I would say that's close to that is in some of the games, like League of Legends, believe it or not, is one of the rare examples. Because unlike Dota, where they play almost all the heroes all, like, all the time, pretty much, it's just what role. And so in Dota, it tends to be more like what concept you want for how you want to play the game is what hero you pick. You don't necessarily just pick the most OP thing. Whereas because League of Legends was kind of tailored to casuals, there's always stuff that's overpowered and, and super strong. Well, that means that in that game, there is still a premium on finding the really weird matchup that no one else understands is actually favored for you. And in this one game, if you've played enough secretly on your Smurf account and you can execute it, you could just get a win off this guy where he thought he got the great matchup. So it does on a, a tiny level exist, but again, the, set, the first point ties in, which is you can do it once, but then if you do it and it's something that actually anyone could do, then everyone's doing it. So it, it diminishing returns, I'd say. Another thing that happened... Oh, and by the way, just one other thing is the, the downside for CS, because you're right, boosts and stuff and spams. The problem with that is just in CS Go, it just doesn't exist as much. Like, for example, the match, the yeah, people who made the maps actually made a lot of them have, like, most areas are blocked off that you'd, you'd boost into. You can even sit... This is, dude, if you're a 1.6 player, you can see areas on CS Go, like a rooftop area. You can't get that. There's, like, a visible wall. Which, if you're a CS 1.6 player, that's like, this is blasphemy. What are you doing? Like, <laughs> I, I used to look, remember before they put patched it, I was on the roofs of Italy all day long there when plebs didn't know you could go up there. And they were going, Where's he shooting me for? Yeah, I'm shooting you in the head all day long. And there's no death camps. You can't do anything about it. So that was, that was amazing, wasn't it? So the other factor as well is in CS Go, you also can't spam walls as much. Like, they made a yeah. way less of them possible to spam. So unfortunately, the text is not there as much, probably because if you have like tens of millions of people playing a game, Stuff like that's probably just going to like irritate the average fan. Unfortunately, the average player they're probably not going to be into it because you could just abuse that heavily in like public. So it's one of those compromises you probably have to make to have a game that has millions of people playing instead of you know I don't know hundred thousand or something. That's, a, that's probably also a small price to pay, into, right? Like two thousand one, we were sitting there. Uh, I remember it vividly. There were seventeen thousand people worldwide that were watching the finals. And I get goosebumps. You know, we were all feeling like we were really part sure. of something special and and tremendously big. For 17 fucking thousand people <laughs> today what you know we're hitting million concurrent or something crazy like that um of course it can't be the same game anymore right uh something had to develop with that also yes um in 2010 i could be going back exactly a decade as you mentioned esports changed for me um counter-strike was like definitely starting to like run out of gas uh, I personally wasn't watching the game anymore as, as I used to when I was going to all these tournaments. Also because at the same time we had the recession, right? So there was a yes. significant dip in the number of friends and like people you knew at events. Um, but in 2010, Star StarCraft made uh, esports something more than it was before that. Um, and it, we became what I sort of considered going back like the thinking man's game that comes they came a, a now a level of strategy and sort of like execution that came into into a certain type of games that then be became esports titles and it seemed to happen overnight like i worked in the industry i sponsored i don't know maybe 40 percent of the top teams back then that's a, that's a significant number of teams sure. and all of a sudden there were events happening in california with 10,000 people you know in, 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 in as a spectatorship that was rarely seen ever you know up until that yes. point like, how would you ex explain that? There's a few interesting details to this. So, like, first of all, there's the factor. It's a very unique one, actually, which is I, I actually think the most undervalued company in the history of esports, you're not going to believe this, is MLG. It's a major league game. And like you're referring to, the people who did all the StarCraft circuit and got all these events with loads of people there. Because here's what they figured out. I, re I remember hearing this detail. It's completely separate. Because that's actually one of my specialties. Because I've literally done my whole life in esports. I'm the sort of idiot that goes and watches a movie about someone else and starts going, that's kind of like esports. People just go like, can you shut the fuck up? I'm trying to watch this movie. Like, so what happened? was i looked at i once wondered how do they get all those fans to go to wrestling matches like how do they get them all because like you know wrestling's cool but like you know it's got a, quite a niche fan base doesn't it? it's not like you know like 
American football or something. It's not like millions of people are going to like want to attend that game. You know, you know, like how courtside seats in the NBA, like they pass them from generation to generation. You can't get them. Well, for things like that, it's so niche. I thought, how do they actually fill those stadiums? And then here's what I noticed, because someone pointed this out to me. Have a look where they're holding the wrestling matches, because, you know, they go on sort of circuit around America. They don't go New York every time, LA every time, Vegas every time. They go to bumfuck nowhere, where, first of all, a lot of those people might be in wrestling, you know. I mean, that's kind of like Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> yeah. And also, because there's nothing going on there, you're competing against almost nothing for the entertainment dollar. And so you can now pack the stadium. Well, here's the interesting thing people don't know. Go back and look at those early MLGs and look where they're held. Again, if they're in California, they're in Anaheim. If they're in some other place, they're, again, they're in like a place you've never heard of in New York or something like that. These weren't in massive places. So actually, they were probably quite clever in terms of where they selected to make the stadium cheap, all these factors, because that's actually kind of been what I think bootstrapped these sports. So I think that's actually, I mean, obviously, it'll seem ironic in the context of my own career, but that's actually what I think they achieved with IEM Kadavitsa was they figured out at the time you couldn't really guarantee you'd fill a stadium. You definitely couldn't fill a stadium with paying customers. And by the way, God forbid, you, to, in theory, if you go from nobody paying to a quarter of the stadium paying, that should be an improvement, right? It looks terrible on camera. You look like you failed. You look like it's dying. So what they actually figured out, this was the genius move of Carmack and the others at ESL, was if we hold it somewhere in Poland that isn't Warsaw or Krakow, we might be able to get the government there to just give us the stadium. And you know what? Make sure it's not too big a stadium. Yeah, we don't want to go 40K yet. 5K, 10K, yeah. And you know what else? The fans will want to come, but would they pay to come? Would their mom and dad pay? Let's just let them all in for free. You can pay if you want to see, but let's also keep capacity full. It's a genius, but it's almost like that technique they use in American TV when there's not enough people to come on a TV show. You bring them in off the street, don't you? Hey, come on in, watch this show, just chat. So I actually think that was one of the secrets, basically, was we had to kind of figure out, like, a half warehouse of like, we've got a venue, we've got a crowd. And if you only see it on camera and I don't tell you where it is, you'll be like, this is the next big thing. But if I point out, if it was the next big, th this is basically why I actually inadvertently got in trouble with all that Katowice stuff. My point basically was, first of all, Katowice is not like the most sick place even in Poland. Like my joke always was, people just didn't understand, unfortunately, that I would tell you that my area is a crap hole. Like I come from the northeast, northeast of England bit where there's nothing. Yeah. So if it had been called like the next major is IEM Middlesbrough, I'd be like, that's garbage as well. Like, don't go there. Like why are we holding it there? Because my point always was, don't tell me that you've made this a global phenomenon. Because if it's a global phenomenon, I'll know because I'll see you in Cowboy Stadium. I'll see you in Madison Square Garden mate, where the Staples Center is. Let's see you in the Bernabeu. Get 80,000 fans in the Bernabeu paying 200 euros a ticket. The revenue will be amazing. Oh, what's that? Yeah, letting people in for free into your stadium that you've been given. Yeah, like the thing is, on the one hand, it's cynical. It's also genius. Like that's how you get to the point where one day now you could have, I saw like season three Worlds was in the Staples Center. Now you can have TI in a massive venue, but... Yeah, I think kind of like there was a clever innovation, a little sort of tweak along the way there, for my money anyway. Yeah. And, and it wasn't like, uh, that was at the time, you know, we were all transitioning out of on gamers. Um, I was starting an agency. I took on ESL as a client. And the first fucking thing I had to do was to fill up the stadium in, uh, in Oakland. And that was not easy. Man. Let me tell you, dude. Like, that was a lot of those events work. in California had issues with, with the attendance. There was once a famous thing, mate. This is cringy because I feel I actually, even though at the time I was at war with ESL, I felt bad for them on this one. There was an event. I can't remember if it was the I am San Jose, I am Auckland, and one of the games. I think it was CS:GO. The League of Legends had sold out because they got CLG and all that. You know, the CS:GO one wasn't selling out. So what happened was, I'm not going to speak out of school here. I'm just saying what I saw on this Reddit post. It looks plausible. What happened basically was someone in the in ESL just basically obviously said similar, like well, we haven't managed to sell them all, so just give the tickets away, just make sure people come. So someone, his way of giving them away was he got his friend and said, like, you want to give all these tickets away? His friend goes immediately to Reddit and says, I've just got a box with 5,000 IEM whatever tickets in and a picture of them. And it's like, oh, jeez, even more. Yeah, like I explained, it's not wrong to do that, but like, that's a bad look. Like the, yeah. the optics of that are garbage, obviously. By the way, one other detail I forgot to mention as well is what I think changed with StarCraft 2 and why it got the bigger audiences is that's the first esport I'm aware of that people who didn't play it were watching. Yes. And it had like the, what I call like the social phenomenon. Because one of the reasons, by the way, why esports didn't have to be big is the same reason why if you were in the 90s and you played Pogs, like that lasted a year and a half. If you came in two years after Pogs, hey guys, who's got the Pogs? 
we're all over that, mate. We're, we're on to like football stickers now or something. You know, for one year, it's the biggest thing ever. And then it's nothing because it was just a fad that everyone was into. Well, some of those games were kind of like that. That's actually why I think StarCraft 2 couldn't last, you know, 10 years as the biggest eSport. Because what happened is it got all the hype and it got the attention. And so you had all these people who maybe StarCraft actually isn't the game for them. But it's the first one they encountered and they see the excitement. Well, if you look, every big eSport after that almost has that like, phenomenon element league of legends of course this game on paper should never have been better than horn and Dota. It's, it's an inferior game say what it killed the casual market oh you got all these people watching you keep going through all the games obviously all the modern ones the battle royales that's the same exact phenomenon going on there like i always tell people this if you want to tell me fortnite's the future esports i mean ironically by the time this interview even comes out it's already not the future like didn't even get a year in apparently but if you want to tell me it's the future you're gonna to have to explain to me how one streamer is like you know for like 25 percent of the views or something like that, that doesn't make sense yeah. he's not even a play he's not even actually like the top pro or anything so and that is like a component which to be fair if you know anything about marketing on the internet you can't make things viral that's the thing they just happen yeah. but you can definitely set the conditions up and then hopefully something likes to touch paper you know yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely and 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 it's interesting right because like what we go back to 2015 i think riot games announced that they had 105 million active players a month there we go <laughs> and it's no but like you know, it blew us all away right because the number sure. was like what eight times higher than the closest competitor right it was like i mean holy fuck right um they had all of china playing to be fair <laughs> oh yeah but still like it was bigger than anything sure. else. no it helps man that definitely will help you a year and a half later PUBG has you know 236 million con uh, active players a month right and where were all these people three years ago because they weren't playing games right <laughs> yes so in the in the span of you know, if, I, if I'm rough and I had a look at the calculation, it's like three to four years. Esports went from literally being, you know, a curiosity yes. to, being, to being a cultural revolution as in, you know, that's, this is the death of sports now because you can't find teenagers to go play for soccer anymore, right? So there's a whole culture that will simply die out yes. because there's no new genetic material coming into the ecosystem or, you know, yes, tiny, tiny bit, right? In just three years. It's true, it's well, that's actually where one of the things that people probably don't know, this is the thing that League of Legends, well, no matter what you think of the game, whether you think it's for noobs, whatever, you know, one thing you must acknowledge with League of Legends is no game in esports history has ever been as global as that game is. It's the only, I always tell people this, when people ask me from CSGO, you don't really like League of Legends. Like, what was a game? No. Like, if I had 10 games, and I was picking one to be a massive esports, I wouldn't pick that one. But there is no other game in which, okay, so when Faker was the best player in League of Legends, I know he was the best player in the world because practically anyone who wanted to play League of Legends and could, could compete against Vic if they'd have gotten to the World Championship. Like, that was possible. They had, unlike, you know, Counter-Strike was Europe and North America. StarCraft was, like, just Korea and then a few weird people in the Netherlands called, yeah. you know, <laughs> or whatever, which perverts and start, like, to play on 56 game modems. You know, the whole point is it was restricted. You, were, you had your own little pools. League of Legends, legitimately, that's where they got those numbers. Not only did they get Korea with Europe and North America, they unlocked all of China. And as soon as you do that, that's where it's like the game, that's the paradigm changer. Because the key thing, it's actually what Valve has never figured out with Dota and CSGO. What they do is, the model we have in the West is still pretty similar. You buy a PC, you have an internet connection, you hear about the game, your friends play the game, you buy the game, you try the game, you play the game. Right? About eight of those first steps don't work in China and Korea. Because in China and Korea, you're 13 years old, you're skiving off doing your homework, you go to the PC bang with your friends, in the PC bang, you don't say what game do people play. Now, you look at what games are installed on the PC, you click on one of those, hey, let's play this one. Uh, you know, like, that's why, mate, everyone says, oh, they don't like FPS games in China. They love Crossfire, what are you talking about? It's just a shit version of Counter-Strike. Yeah. It's just that Counter-Strike isn't on the machine. Crossfire is. So that whole model there, where you, basically where you had to give the game away for free, but in a very clever manner, People like Valve still haven't actually caught up to. They still haven't figured out how to get all the Koreans to play Dota, you know. So uh, that's an area where, see what you like about the game, there are certain things that they did with how they marketed and how they actually, like, distributed the game. Again, the distribution was a game changer. Remember when League of Legends went free to play? That was when all the competitors used to cost money. Horn used to cost money. Yeah. Absolutely. Like, you know, for me, for me, it's like, you know, when I look at uh, Apex and PUBG versus a title like Overwatch, like, you know, I, I'm I'm seeing a Han versus League of Legends model repeating itself of course. throughout history. It's the same thing as well. And and the sad thing is, it's like I was saying earlier. Like for anyone who doesn't know, like the generations of those games, the MOBA games, was like 
Hon was literally the better graphics version of Dota. So all the good, all the good players were in that initially, actually, before Dota 2. They were all like, this is going to be the game for sure. If you remember, there was like all the Dota clones. It was like eight different yeah. games, you know. Loads of them that weren't even League of Legends. And League of Legends was the new one. It was like, oh, that's for just like someone who wants to play like, and their girlfriend can play support with them. Or so it was that sort of thing, you know. It was like a casual game. Little did we know, if one appeals to the purists and one appeals to everyone, we see which one's going to win that battle, don't you? And we've seen that before. Thomas Mike versus Quig, right? Of course. <laughs> yes. Quake? Luckily, uh, I, I, I knew when to jump ships on that one, mate. <laughs> I didn't go down with the Quake ship. I know. I found, I, I found the news where you're speculating. I wonder if the CPL will keep doing Quake things. Like <laughs> Exactly. I um, for, for, me, for me, it's actually like, I think it comes down to, you know, starting out your journey. In Quake, the first time you, you played and you played against someone who was really good, you would leave the server with a minor score. Of course. There has never been a bigger humiliation in the history of competitive gaming than you leaving a game with a negative score. I don't remember seeing it since. Dude, I'm not joking. That's why the first early esports people were like, it, like the, the analogy is tired, but it hasn't been properly applied. It was like the Wild West, because here's the part they don't explain. They think Wild West just means it was crazy. No, the Wild West, the reason it was crazy is because who the fuck is going to leave a safe part of the world where you can have a house and a family and, all that, and go to these frontier towns where, as you see, you know, there's people, bank robbers, the whole town could get killed by India. There's a million things could go wrong. You have to be a crazy motherfucker to want to do that. You have to want to push the boundaries. So all the people in the early days, I always used to tell people this, if they can now play CSGO once and go, not really for me, don't really like it. It's like, you're, you're not a gamer in the same way I was, mate. Because the thing is, when I first played, I was on 56k modem with 300 ping. And, and obviously all the Swedish guys on 20 ping, I, I can't even see them, they're just killing me. <laughs> if I even got any kills, that was sick. I felt so, like the thrill of getting any kills was amazing. Mate, I played for the first three months without knowing you could use the mouse. So you can imagine how much I was getting reamed out. I was trying to use the keys to turn the gun like you know, what? it's like having no reactions, isn't it? It's ridiculous. Yeah. So if you add all these factors up, like who would, what modern kid, just a random kid off the street, what, who would play under those circumstances? You wouldn't, you have to be really sort of drawn to it. So the initial experience, like the threshold for how good it had to be, it was a lot lower back then. Yeah. It has to basically be like a sick experience from day one now. I, I had no idea why I was so into counters like the second I saw it at an insert cafe, but I was, and I, um, someone showed me assault. CS assault the map. Sure. Um, sat down. Eight hours later, I got up again. Like, oh fuck, blah, blah. I went straight back to the office, um, and I started building a Counter Strike website. I, I I didn't know what I was seeing. I can tell sure. you now, and I'd love to hear your perspective on that. So I was running one of the biggest gaming websites in Denmark at the time. I started a Counter Strike section that eventually actually became bigger <laughs> than than you know this mainstream coverage gaming website. That was a like holy cow. Um, none of my industry peers understood that. How can you focus so much on one game? That's stupid. It's not even active yes. in retail. You know, they didn't understand what yeah. the community was happening. <laughs> but you it's know what happened? Much. Like my apartment, you know, as sort of the organizer of all these things. All of a sudden, every second weekend, you know, there would be a drinking party with people who played Counter Strike. Gaming became social. Yes. Right? <laughs> so like the anti-social well, thing. It was, was it was social for anti-social people. That's the key <laughs> thing, right? Yeah, that's the whole point. The, the kind of person who, like the old cliche, of if they'd gone to a real school disco, they'd be the one stood in the corner going, when can I get home and play Counter Strike? This is terrible. I can't talk to anyone. The idea is, if you could then meet those people who also play the game, what's mad is somehow it allowed you to be social in a way you couldn't otherwise. Like, actually, this will sound like a very divergent topic, but I'll throw it in here because something I've thought about a lot over the years, and I think it's actually a missing component that people don't understand about the internet culture, is a lot of people who are in internet culture to some degree are probably on the autistic spectrum. They're the sort of people who are like, they like very specific things, and they like it very specific way. The way of communicating, as, as you alluded to with some of those forum posts, can be very black and white and very harsh, you know, like they don't have the social mores and the graces. So to get those people together, it's like herding cats. It's gonna be pretty difficult, but if you can get that group together, the key thing is, cause they don't have the social contact otherwise, the bond's gonna be amazing. That's why the community feeling back then was obviously a lot more than now. Now it's so many people, you can't have a community feeling. It was like a village back then. You know, even if you hate, like the thing you said about Carmack, listen, I hated the guy. But also, if, you, if I had to have a drink with someone and talk about quit, he's like one of the 10 people I could have done it with, so I would have, you know. It's like another guy in the village, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, and rival reason, whatever developed over time, but I also, there was a sense of, of belonging for all of us, right? So no matter how much we might have hated each other back then, if, if there was a point where you could do something for each other, you did it because, of course you did. Yes. Like, that was a code. <laughs> uh, it, it just became like that. So, 
throughout your career, you have uh, you have you know gone from working from the smallest of companies, literally, to working for a Fortune 500 company. Um, sure. You've seen like this incredibly wide span. What would you say, you know, based on your experience and 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 working both in teams and as independent, where are you happiest? Well, here's the thing. I'm, this is not even an exaggeration. I, the last few years, especially, because like in each area, like I didn't just try to be good in one area. I'd go like, right, I've, I'm starting to get pretty good there. Let's, let's expand to the next. And eventually, like as you may know, I didn't go on camera for about the first 12 years or something. If you saw an interview's text, if you heard an interview with me, I was behind the camera. Like I wasn't an on camera personality. That's a whole separate career I had to build up. So now that I've got all of these options, I've had many amazing offers the last few years. Like I've had people come to me big name team owners and be like, you know what, I'll, I'll literally give you like equity in the company. You're just going to be the general manager, make all my great teams. And I was like, listen, that is a sick offer. And it sounds really intellectually challenging, but I'm not exaggerating. I'm actually doing what I want to do right now. Like, you, it, no, it doesn't wouldn't matter how much you offered. First of all, I'm making a good living, but it wouldn't matter how much more because it wouldn't be worth it for what I'd lose. Yeah. So yeah, I have to say, luckily for me, I've been able to get a lot of it done independently because actually, funnily enough, the on games experience was that was the, the last period when you had to write for the biggest site to be the biggest writer because back then this is what everyone in traditional media is finding is but, but i work for the new york times yeah that doesn't matter mate who are you how good's your article we only look at your article already i don't give a fuck about the new york times i don't buy the new york times what are you talking about well back then esports was like that like if you couldn't get into the top site you you might have the best article ever but if you're on the fourth biggest site you're not gonna have the most hits the key thing was Online became about personal branding and it became with things aggregators, YouTube, Reddit, social media. Now the journalist can be bigger than the site. So I can tell you one of the reasons I remain independent now is because I would never make as much money as a main site a writer for a site. Because for a start off, I'd do my, the same content and then they'd want all exclusivity and I wouldn't be able to do other stuff. Then secondly, like I can get the identical hits on any site that I'm on because it's all going to come from Reddit, social media. Again, so the world just changed completely in that sense. Now, luckily, I didn't pick up on it as, as early as some other people, but I was able to sort of like get my head in the game going on because what people don't know actually is when I left on gamers, I actually initially just went out there as you'd expect and went to all the big companies and said, you know, I'm available if anyone wants to make me a job offer. And what's amazing is I thought to myself, ah, it's probably going to be like a way worse offer though, isn't it? And immediately I got like three offers that all said, whatever you got paid at the last company will match it. And I was like, well, you do know I got paid this much. Which at the time was a very high salary for an esports journalist. Yeah. And they were like, we can pay that. So at the time, what's mad is I thought, right, well, got to be smart here. What I'll do is I'll tell them, give me a month and then I'll decide which offer I want to take. So I need to think it over, like really seriously. And, you know, I need to decompress as well because the experience I just had. And in that month, I thought to myself, well, while I'm waiting, may as well do some work and get back in the, the floor things. So I'll do some independent stuff. And I'm not joking, by the end of the month, I'd already gotten like YouTube set up, started to do stuff on some sites that were paying me freelance, that I was something like 75% of the way to the salary already. And so then I was like, wait a minute, I could just do this all myself. Like, why why join a site? Why, why be in that structure, you know? So, um, for those of you watching this and who don't know, I was the guy who led to Foreign Go uh, at OnGamers. This is actually the first time we've talked to each other since. Um, by the way, you, you, were the, you were also the person who came out of OnGamers the best, in my opinion. Sure. Right? Um, yes. I have a, I, 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 look, I did a Google Trends graph for, um, for your career, and it was almost like beautiful to behold that, um, that in 2013, 2014, <laughs> I feel like esports sort of like started. Esports hits teenage years. I almost describe it as teenage years. It was sort of clumsy kind of depressed and angry at everything without really knowing why. Like I hated mom and dad for some reason, specifically dad. Um, and, and we had to learn like what would happen and, and how to do things, right? Like what was the exact spectrum of political correctness now that everyone in the yes. world apparently was looking at us. Yes. Uh, at the time we were in a culture that, uh, Fortune 500 culture that is as fucking different from his force as it possibly could be, I think, right? That's why I say, by the way, I, like, I actually, by the way, have never held any ill will against you for firing me from on Givers because I actually understand that the way that that works, if you understand the mechanism of how, like, fake outrage is not only started, but then perpetuated, people who are political activists, they're very sneaky. They know the mechanisms of power. So what they do is they know it's actually not about getting 100,000 plebs who are just viewers to hit the person. 
What you want to do is you want to get one person higher up, high enough, high up in a company enough that they go, someone way down in that hierarchy saying, what? Just fire the person. And at that point in time, when that comes down the line, you can't go, oh, sorry, boss, uh, to the boss, to the boss. Tell him I'm not going to do it. No, it's over. Like, the, that's why we never had to have a conversation about him. It was obvious. Uh, that's uh, what happens when you work for a Fortune 500 company, you do stuff like that. Um, I also say that um, uh, one of the interesting things I found in your uh, incredibly body of, of content you've produced since was uh, you were, there, there was a thing about you know, people leaving teams or getting kicked out of teams and how you decide to leave them. And, um, and you had some, you know, as, as you very often do, some relatively abrasive statements that could easily be in interpreted in some way. Um, it was also for me one of those things where I can definitely say that this person uh, lives his life as he speaks words. Um, because uh, the conversation that when I called you up together with uh, the number of HR representatives from all over the, around the world that had to be there, um, Warren's comment was, oh, okay, well, let's get on with it. <laughs> you were the least uncomfortable person on the I mean, call. There's nothing to talk about <laughs> if you know it's done, right? Yeah, if it's done, you may as well, may as well just move on, right? Just clean break, let's go. I'm not one of those people where it's like, oh, let's go through it all and the emotional labor we're all having, and but why? And oh, let's. No. It's done. Let's move. Yeah. yeah, start the next thing. On to the next. Yeah, and it was like you know, if I hadn't done it, then the guy who would have fired me tomorrow would just have done it for me. You know, that I've, of course, I've been very yeah, I get it. Man. I get it. People don't know, by the way, I'll actually mention this. <clears throat> One detail people probably will never know about you, because first of all, some people. I mean, I think Richard's implied it in some of his content, like. Obviously, you made some mistakes yourself when you were on Gamers. Well, everyone did, actually, by the way. It was obviously a brand new environment for all of us. Like you say, we went from literally writing for our own website. Somehow we conned people and thinking that was like a really big thing. And all of a sudden, we're all in a massive company where it's like, we're actually supposed to be like a New York Times writer and held to those standards. Well, one thing people won't know is I had a bunch of problems that year. I would actually call them just socialization problems. So when I had each of those problems, a normal company fires you at the first one. I think I had my third one about eight months later when I was fired. So like in that scenario, one of the reasons I wasn't fired actually is because you were my boss. Like I remember when the thing at Kadavitsa happened, I called you up on Skype about an hour later when I got back to the hotel. And I even told you all stuff like, if you want me to take like a salary cut, you know, or like work my way back in. And you just basically said like, listen, it's happened. Like we'll deal with it. Like, let's just like lay low for now. Let us handle like what we're going to say about this. You just figure it out. Don't worry about any of that stuff, and we'll just move on. Because I, I would assume, I mean, you could answer this, like you could see that there was value beyond just, like it was worth taking like a minor PR hit there, if it's worth it for what you're going to get out of it beyond that. So, yeah, I 100% uh, so agree. Like, one of the things I struggled with, to, to, and I still don't think I found a good answer for it, was what was my role at OnGamers? Was it to be VP of eSports? What for people ask that? No, no, or was it to be, <laughs> or was it to be the, the team manager? For, yes. for, for, for the team of, you know, arguably, what, 80% of the most talented content creators in the fucking industry put together under one roof. It was the super team. Right? And, um, and I've always had this belief that if you just find, like, really, really, really great talent, you put them together, like, you know, you create great things, then it's my job to take care of, like, all these things that are then trying to, to, to yes. eat the team, right? And I think I did that as, uh, as well as I, almost anyone could, to be honest with you. Um, what do you, I don't know if you remember this because most people don't understand this. When we joined uh, CBS Interactive as, and as a team called On Gamers, um, they had just relaunched GameSpot.com, which is the price uh, cow that pays for the whole party, yes. right? Forty-five million dollars a year or something like that, uh, and and all the money that this company, that is not an entrepreneurial company, would yes. invest into something new, um, had had some some pretty large checks written to it. One. Uh, me showing up and saying, okay, I'll, 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 you're going to do this, let me try to do it well. Uh, because I think you're going to fuck it up, if not. Had severe political ramifications. There were a lot of people at GameSpot that wanted that position, and they definitely did not want some outsider. And holy fuck, these people are good at playing political games that I did not even know existed. Like, um, in the ninth grade in school, I was at the principal's office, you know, almost more than <laughs> I was at my sure. thing. I had seven HR complaints against me. At, at uh, on gamers, it was a it was a weapon. Um, yes. Yeah. So uh, at the same time, you know, they had relaunched Gamespot. They had lost, I think it was twenty seven percent of traffic on the price cow. Yeah, because this is when you know people going to the site was dying. You had to go to Reddit at the time. Yeah. So um, it meant for us as on gamers 
that I had committed to some numbers that I believe we could hit every month. Uh, most people thought I guess it was crazy. smashed them, right? We, we killed it. We crushed those awesome. numbers. But those numbers were based on, you know, the team delivering an amazing fucking body of work. Uh, it wasn't based on the support we were getting from CBS because once we had gotten, I, I, w I was capable of, you know, I almost gave blowjobs for this, but I managed to somehow squeeze four development days out of, you know, this team of uh, 11 programmers and what, four designers. I got four days total to launch on gamers. That's, that's the thing that went live. And it took us five months to get a fucking share to Twitter button. Like, yep. as, as basic functionality as social sharing on the website, right? So, um, so we were just, yeah, like no one wanted us. We were taking up budget that they could have spent on something else. So like we had no friends in the world. And I, and I, I think the thing that surprised me the most was actually how quickly the community sort of public perception was to switch to like, oh, these are these, these people whose content are like, arguably the content that we enjoy the most of all, all the things that we click on. Um, now they've banded together, so they're evil because like they're doing a thing together. That was really surprising to me, actually, like how, uh, you know, how quickly it became like, oh, I did this trying to corner the market by hiring all the good content creators. Oh. Like, no, they're trying to build a company that works, that is sustainable. Like, it's not evil. It's literally survival. <laughs> the wildest thing as well has to be, dude, like that exact year of when all that happened, basically all the stuff people now know and we're talking about like 2017 we knew then because that company those two different companies gamespot and on gamers they represented the future of online media and the dying past because as you're saying the payroll for gamespot must have been insane and yet what's insane really is the reason why you smashed the numbers is they didn't know again the guy who writes for gamespot he just goes in he writes up his little review he submits it it goes on to gamespot and it gets the hits so he doesn't know about promotion Obviously, me, Slasher, Cyborg, Matt, Travis, we, we're only there because we made our own brands. And so as a result, dollar for dollar, we, we would have been the MVPs of the company. Like, they, I bet an entire division was getting the hits some of us were getting, you know. Uh, uh, arguably, 100%. Uh, um, <laughs> after OnGamers was closed down then, right? Um, I, uh, I took a position at GameSpot.com just to <laughs> make money, and it was offered to me, and ah, I'm not homeless. Um, that sounds I, like a poison chalice. I took GameSpot social reach from 6 million to 100 million. Just, you know, from having worked with the team. <laughs> and it was actually exactly what you said. Like, I, I just, okay, great, you can write about games. You obviously don't even add a thumbnail to your work, so you, you should probably stop yeah. doing it now, right? And I just took all the publishing away from them. Started distributing it on, you know, free on social media. They were like outraged that, you know, I would take a long thing, cut it down and release it for free because it costs money. Yes. Um, that's when that's when profitability came back. <laughs> it was also to understand how poisonous it was. Uh, Gamespot at the time, I believe, had had a firing round for either eight years in a row or five years in a row. Like, can you imagine what culturally that does to a group of people <laughs> sure. that you see your friends just die out every year, right? And now some asshole comes along who's who doesn't speak uh, corporate language whatsoever and uh, and can hire a whole new team to go conquer esports. <laughs> It's the you, barbarians you, that it gets, man. You, you can understand the animosity also, in all fairness, right, from, from their angle. Anyway, we, we, all, we all learned something. I think it was, um, it, for all the bad things that happened at the time, like, you know, as I said to them, when the Katowicz thing happened, like, this will feel a lot less impactful, you know, three months from now. Time has a tendency to sort of, like, oh my God, like, what's happening? And then sure, yeah. <laughs> three weeks later, it's, eh, whatever. <laughs> um, was there something at the OnGamers time you wish you could have done differently, though? That's a good question. Um, I'm not sure because the thing is, to be fair, I mean, listen, some of the other people who were at the site, they also, you know, had their own lane and like, you know, one did interviews, one did new stuff. Like, to be fair, I already was trying to expand out and do other stuff. So I actually think generally, I made, even though I, didn't, I was there the least time, I made the most of that experience, you know, like I, I start, that's, people forget that's where I started Summoning Insight. That was my first talk show I did. That was actually when I first started to do CSGO analysis. So I, I was able to build up on that. By the way, I'll also mention that. This is another detail people would be amazed by. I had an exclusive contract, obviously. Everything I do is for gamers. But when I actually told you, like, you know, I've been invited to work at like the CSGO major, and oh, now someone wants me for another event. You said, this is what no one else would probably do, is you basically said, like, okay, you can do it. In fact, you don't have to, like, negotiate with me or anything. Like, for me, it's branding. You know, the idea is when people see you on camera, well, now it makes it better that you're a CSGO writer, right? It's a way to actually brand the thing. But the problem is, even to this day, mate, a lot of people and companies would be too short-sighted there. They just see it as like, 
only they can win, you know. So they would actually limit you in that sense. So actually, I generally found it to be a pretty good experience. Like even the mistakes were the things that like you, if you only benefit from when you learn from them, you know. Yeah, yeah. And you learn by finding out if something works or it doesn't work. Period, right? And like I think one of the things about esports has always been such a drive for me has been you don't really know if this thing will work. No. Because you know, for at least for a lot of the years, right? There's like no one had really done that before. So, or like you know, how you just scotch tape this thing together has, hasn't been done that way before, right? Like, uh, and especially at on gamers, I would argue, like no one had ever gotten you know, what was probably an, an investment, probably exceeding a million dollars to be honest. You know, overall, think how you know fucked up these companies are. To give um, anyone context, by the way, at the time that we had that kind of a budget. Like the best esports journalist in the world was probably making fifteen thousand euros a year. I am. Um, so you can imagine the jump up that this site was. Yeah, it was also. I'll, I'll probably never experience this again in my time as like you know someone who runs teams and so on. But like it was, it was cool because like I remember when you asked me, okay, can I get this in salary? And I was like, yes. Yeah, the problem is you said yes. I've only I only realized that about a year later, mate. But like in any negotiation, if you name the figure and they immediately say yes. You definitely ask for too little there, and especially because you know some of the other people who are my co-workers there. They, they didn't like directly tell me, but it was pretty obvious some of them asked for more. And it was like, ah, oh, whatever. Luckily, I was I'm the sort of person who I don't tend to get jealous of people. I just see my own thing, and I go, that's my thing. I'm a different person than them, you know. But yeah, put it this way, yeah. I, for me, that was. By the way, I asked. I even did the thing. By the way, in my head, where I I thought of like this would be a lot. I'll put one key on top of that. And so then when you said yes immediately, it was like, wait a minute, I was going below. I thought I was. I thought you were going to go. Well, you know, five hundred less. Or that. What if well, you'd have to do more for that? So yeah, it wasn't a great sign when the person goes, "Yes, they, I'll tell you." I think you even said, "I'll write up the contract and send it to you tomorrow." Or something like that. This is this is bullshit, you know. So I'll be honest. Like if you were my first. The first thing that I thought of when this job became a. Uh, By the way, I don't know if you know this. I've just remembered this because this is from the conversation we had when you were hiring me. And you know what's hilarious is you actually told me. When you hired me, you said you're going to be the most difficult employee I ever had, but you could be the best. And you know what's hilarious about that is at the time I told you I wasn't on camera person. I was thinking, how am I going to be difficult? I'm actually like pretty legendary for just doing my work, you know. And I was thinking, I'm not going to be any prompt this guy. You know, famous last words. It turned out like I don't know. You, you're you're on the money on that one. I'll give you credit <laughs> in both regards. Well, hey, like um, I thought I knew a lot. About everything, especially esports, when we started this team of right, and it was it was truly a humbling experience also to work with you, Travis, Cybermat, Slasher, even right. Like uh, there were so many people who had a amazing specialized knowledge, very like community based knowledge, and I found it fucking inspiring. Like, I, I, if there's something I miss, it would actually be just to have you know a place where like people of this caliber actually chat to each other, sort of like, <laughs> um, because that was that was that was cool. Well, I'll say actually one thing people will never know, and this this will sound so weird, but actually you know the period in time where we'd be Reddit banned, right? And so as a result, we now had to go backwards and start trying to get all the traffic to the website, which is like, oh Jesus, that doesn't even work. That that's it going back in time. But what was amazing was we were starting to do it. We were actually starting through social media to get people somehow to not go from Reddit and to come to the site. And one of the ways I know I am myself did that at the time, because at the time, you know, obviously we had budgetary issues, etc. That's when I started trying to think of like more content that you could do just from your home, right? And one of the things that was really weird about that is it was terrible because I knew the site was going to die and we probably can't make it, you know, like you can't survive without Reddit. Yeah. But in what a mad sense, I got a feeling for what it must be like when you're like a city under siege, you know, like the Battle of Britain, you know, that sort of thing. Because the, what the, the famous thing people always say is that believe it or not, they didn't have like insanely low morale. It was all like, right, screw it like we're going to beat these guys like let's all just stick together like i'll help you you help me like you have to in that scenario otherwise you're just going to die out so what was mad was the actual camaraderie was very high and i remember myself this might sound like cheesy like some other movie but what i genuinely i mean at the time i know in other interviews people have mentioned this so i'll reference the guy on camera my cameraman was a guy called solly right mm -hmm. and he was a guy who at the time i only knew and i obviously didn't know him from before i worked at on game so at the time i'd spent around him as my cameraman he told me a bunch of stuff about his life. And so, for example, he just told me, like, oh, yeah, you know, my wife's expecting a kid. And then this is right about when we get banned from Reddit, right? So I used to literally think to myself, if I'd already done, like, my article for the day or I'd already got something planned out, I would think to myself, if I could do, like, a video and anything else to make the site succeed, then that guy might not lose his job. We actually all might make it through this. Like, 
it, we should give everything for it. Whereas before that, it's a job. You do you, what you do. You do it's quality. It's ever, so it's a different mentality. But in a way, there was there was a thrill to that. It was kind of exciting. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I saw an interview um, that Richard Lewis did with a uh, slasher recently, where he asked him um, you know, about uh, all this stuff, and uh, and he asked him this loaded question, a uh, uh, similar loaded question, where he like. So did you do it? Like, did you do this thing that ended up getting all these these people fired? And Slash, it took a long time to say yes. Um, I, I, it's not a relevant question to be honest with you. Like, in my opinion, um, the question is like, did you break Reddit's rules? <laughs> and 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 do you think that whatever happened after that was, you know, even close to the reality of, of realm of affair, right? And it did, didn't matter that you know <laughs> that he did something that cost 14 people. I had to fire them, so I know. Yeah, watching people that jumps because that I I would argue that he didn't. In in all fairness, I would argue Slasher. Was oh no, he he, he yeah. wasn't the one who did it that. Was, it was Reddit, but like it was not Slasher that did that. It was uh, you know some guy who just made a decision based on whatever principles that he thought was right, and that has yes. most likely not been thought out very well at the time. Um, it's just the problem is if everyone in that community hears the rules are broken, they act like it was the fucking tablets from mount sinai that god sent down it's like you know just a random guy that none of us know made that rule like have we actually discussed if the rule's fair like we haven't that's what's weird so actually i didn't know the term back then but it's a great term for it. it's called gaslighting yeah. and it's where people just tell you what your reality is so much that even you start to get it you start to go like yeah i'm a terrible person aren't i yeah i did break those rules then you remember wait a minute this rule actually is a very weird rule it's got a lot of like loopholes a lot of people are breaking it in slash's case he just did the most stupid way to break the rule like he was so blatant that they made an example of him and, and us as a site unfortunately but i would agree by the way i don't blame him entirely for that it was a lot of other stupid things he did that made me dislike him yeah yeah, yeah absolutely <laughs> um i it's just a shame because like um uh, the, one of the things that i felt bad you know, after was every time I saw this thing come up, um, and you guys as a team uh, were accused of vote manipulation. Yep. This is a very tactical word that the chick from uh, Reddit used every time yes, she mentioned. Yes, I remember this. But she would always say they were yep. vote manipulating. Yep, exactly. Yeah, and so uh, used to think I was doing it as well. Yeah, I felt bad too. Like you know, we were vote manipulating because it felt like a really shitty thing to do. What she meant, uh, as as best as I can tell, uh, with vote manipulation, is the Content creator who just spent uh, you know five hours putting together an awesome piece of work that submits it to Reddit. That's it. <laughs> it's the submission that make it available to the user base to vote on it that was called vote manipulation. And and when we used to tweet the link, which by the way, this is an inter interesting detail. That never. I'm literally being serious here. That was never an official rule that you can't tweet the link. What they purposely did was put this loophole that said you can tweet and put links on social media because what website that's an online site doesn't want it to be shared around. Like that would be suicide. So obviously the cartel plebs don't share the link. They want them to. What they really meant was you can't. You can do it unless you're really successful. Then because actually I don't like the idea that you're getting all these hits. So what's mad is like here's the interesting detail. Last year, they changed that rule, and you can now do. You can now tweet the links again. But um, they also changed one more thing, if I'm not mistaken, which is that um, you can also pay per outgoing click that comes from content on uh, Reddit, and oh, it's right. fifty cents a click. Do you have, do you have any yeah, question about we, we why? Have, we could have run on gamers off that. And I think we'd have had I, access to a share of that. We could have run on gamers off that budget. I think. Uh, I think the success of the team was what got us banned because no one had done that yes. in such a sort of industrial yeah. approach. Not, not uh, cheating or manipulating, in my opinion. People submitting their own content to a platform that discovers content. If you tie it into what we were talking about before with the traditional media angle, that's the whole point. When they saw some random kid from New York is getting all these hits on a news article, more than like the GameSpot version would be, he must be cheating. What they didn't know was, no, the idiot at GameSpot has never bothered to learn how Reddit works. He doesn't even know what time you release an article. He doesn't know how to get a retweet from the player. He doesn't know anything. He knows how to write the article, and he thinks that's it. He doesn't know that's step one. You can write the best article ever. If you fail all the Reddit stuff, no one sees it. Yeah. So what's mad is, the thing is, that's where we were ahead of the curve. Yeah, absolutely. And um, Slash said the thing also, you know, he started his interview with Richard Lewis saying, um, that, uh, that he was the Reddit expert and uh, that he had taught the rest of us. And I would 100% uh, know what well, you knew, but uh, absolutely, yes. And I'll also. So I'd say with all social media, by the way, Twitter, all of it, yeah. Oh, yeah, no, I was ahead of his time in figuring all this stuff out and, be, you know, and, and using it as an amazing tool for him. He took a lot of time to sort of like educate the rest of the staff um, 
I also say that you know when you when you hire 14 people for an esports website, which is a lot of people to sort of like fill in, um, you don't hire anyone that hasn't worked for an esports website before, right? So everyone who joined the team came with experience, and it was a universal reaction from you know p people as as we onboarded them. Oh, you don't upload your Reddit content because every other website they had been to was actually yeah. doing that, right? Um, the irony was everyone else who vote manipulated wasn't as good at vote manipulating as we were at not vote manipulating. Yeah. That's the well, that's the tragedy of it all because we'll always be labelled as the vote manipulators forever. Yeah. And that's a shame because uh, uh, even Reddit as a company was founded on the fact that you know this vote manipulation, being able to add, add news that other people could then aggregate and sort through and rank. Um, you know, they had burner fake accounts where they, the founders could do that, right? So they would just submit no random links. Um, I, I think it's a shame. Uh, after after this awful, after I had to let you go, I obviously knew that everything was going to like that was it, right? It's not yes. So I kept it going for as long as I could because um, one, I didn't feel like I owed CBS anything. Uh, every promise that they had made to me to get these people in and get all this team started, they had failed on except for paying the money every month. Yes. That was the one thing that they did. Everything else, I would argue that they failed on. Um, so I just tried to keep these people, you know, <laughs> salary as long as possible. Um, when it was, when I understood that, okay, now it's about time, you know, I can't like pull this out any longer. Um, I took five days uh, sick so I could extend it one more month before I could let the family go. Uh, Solly had a baby. And uh, the, the people at the higher up decided, okay, we, we can't do that. that. That's way, ooh. Huh. So we got another one, like, you know, so I was capable of extending, I think, like three months for, for, for almost everyone. I also did a thing, I, I have never told you that. Uh, I had actually reached out to people before, you know, I had that conversation with you. And uh, I know that at least Tobias Sherman was actually waiting with uh, one or two sponsorship offers for the shows, which is why, you know, Trust me, this one cost me a lot of discussion internally when, uh, you know, I gave you the shows that you had done for Ungamers, so you could take them with you as well, you were sort of like IP. Yep. That's and another thing as well. Yeah, I'm running inside after foreign, like, you know, who would yeah, want exactly. to take that over? Like, so sure. I said, like, guys, this has absolutely no value to anyone, but it has value to this guy who created it. Why are we not giving it? You know, and, 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 and you know, I was capable of getting that to you. And, you know, so I, I knew that you would, you would be okay. You, you would, you were going to land okay. Um, not everyone else was, was as lucky, right? There are also people who, sure. you know, staff writer from Bosnia or whatever, like, you know, he's not going to easily go and then find yep. the next thing. Maybe today, but back then, the, the talent was a lot harder to discover, I would argue. Um, oh, e e e enough about that. Um, between StarCraft, between League of Legends, between Overwatch, versions, Quake in between, would you consider yourself an expert? You mean as in like in the sense of like someone who knows like the in depth for game and the strategy and these sorts yeah. of things? Well, that's an interesting aspect because first of all, in CSGO, that's basically what they call you if you're an analyst. Yep. But if anyone knows, I I actually with my style of analysis, I'm more like an entertainer. Like I've showman. It, we also have a concept that I notice Americans don't understand. Where in England we don't call them an analyst, we call them a pundit. And that's why you can have, and the difference is, pundit's just a guy who's paid for his opinions. And so that's why if you watch English football, yes, one guy might be like Alan Shearer, legendary striker, but the other guy might be a journalist. He might be a guy who's just followed the game his whole life. Well, the concept there is, Alan Shearer's going to tell you the player's point of view, what he'd do. The other guy's going to tell you the narrative, and what this means for the team and who they should sign and stuff. Stuff that Alan Shearer might not be able to tell you, actually. That might not be his wheelhouse. So when I actually started doing some of the analysis stuff, I used to initially do some jokes as I was learning that, and then normal analysis, like anyone else here was on the side or whatever. But what happened was, first of all, I got very successful at the part that was nothing to do with, the, with being an expert. So everyone who always tries to hate and go, you're not an expert. It's like, you guys don't like that. I know what you guys like. And it's, you're not, you're lying, guys. You don't like that. You like the shows and the jokes. What do you think that's the Reddit clip? The really sick analysis of the hilarious banter. We all know the answer to that. So I started to do that more anyway. So I was naturally gravitating there. And then crucially, because I actually, people won't know this. I'm not like a guy who likes to work in a team. But if I can sort of optionally choose when to be in a team, I actually do like to interact with people. So what I did was when the real experts came in, like Yan Korn, Sponge Lee, these people who have been pros on a deep level, the ring game leaders. I actually said to these people behind the scenes, like famously Yanko, I said to him, listen, I know that you would do that part better than I do, 
but we're going to each get one minute to talk. So here's what I'm going to do. You're going to take all of my minutes in terms of like the tactical aspect. Just don't talk about this part. Like I picked like the pick ban in CSGO and then I'm just going to do my banner. And I said, here's what I'll do as well. Whenever I do my thoughts, if you can find like a, like a, a point you were going to make anyway and connect it to that, just wait until I've finished and connect it. And it'll look seamless. It'll look like a show. And what I basically started to learn was something I've actually learned is basically he's done in television production. It's like, you've got to manage the personalities. You've got to have a balanced show and you've got to have someone who brings this to someone. You know, when I first started, it was three people. You each took a minute. And sometimes the third guy was just going, well, similar to those guys. It's like, he was garbage. So in, in the game like CSGO, I will actually just straight up say I'm an expert. Like, I'm, this is not an exaggeration. Like, it sounds like a sick line for a poster, but it's real. I've watched every high-level game of Counter-Strike or Counter-Strike Global Affairs offensive ever played and i remember them all and i've even gone back and watched some of them twice so no one else alive can say that or if they can that guy's probably a dangerous to society if he's off on his own somewhere he's really done that like I, I, he might need to be on a watch list somewhere you know so <laughs> what i would say is in csgo i would say i'm an expert in fact what i often said is because it's a it's a, within my branding you know it's a controversial statement but it's true which is i always tell people i know more about couch track than anyone who's ever lived and they immediately go what the fuck there's no way you know more than the player i didn't say that he knows more than me in this area. I know more overall, though. Like, I know stuff he doesn't know. It's, remember, this entire field. So in CSGO, I would say I am. But I would say in the other games, I haven't even tried to do that. Like, League of Legends is such an in-depth game with so many people playing. You need to give your whole life to that. Like, I have people who remind me of me 10 years ago where I was just a nerd doing all the research. They had to do that and, you know, sleep like three hours a night just to know what was going on in the game because they have to watch every game. So in those games, I explicitly came in as interviewer, different skill set, or showman, show host, for example. So instead of being the, the expert, I'm the host that time. So in the other games, I've always kind of known my lane. Like, I never, I'm not the guy who tries to, like, crawl by my way in somewhere I'm not wanted. I, like, I find the area that, like, this is my niche, and my mentality has always been, like, if you vibe with this niche, then I'm going to succeed. Hopefully, there can be some overlap. If it doesn't, that's fine. Someone else can do that job, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, another... Oh, there's a lot of another interesting topic I came across, you know, just diving into your content and really, you know, going through these hundreds and hundreds of videos. Um, so for instance, one of the things that has changed in your life since uh, we worked together is that you don't have, I don't know, you maybe had like 19,000 followers on Twitter or something. Of course. They, what is it? It's hundreds of thousands of, of, of followers, right? Um, and I saw one episode where you were mentioning stuff about, oh, you know, like when, when you get to a certain size, you will always get, you know, like a certain number of random cheats or mistweets that go to you. Like, you know, life just changes yep. because you see there's a different scale. Tell me about that experience. Like, I would love to know what's that like and what's, what's your day like? Yeah, well, it ties into what you said earlier, which is that when, like, because people like Slasher came along and introduced us all to Twitter. And at the time, actually, we used to just say, I already have ISA, I don't need this. Like, but he's like, no, no, this is going to bring in outside people. Well, when we all joined it, I always used to say this, when we all had a thousand followers, we knew all a thousand people. It was a people from ESL and the people from Fragbyte and the people from this site, the HLW, you know, it was all the people we all knew. And all we did, by the way, is the same thing we did on forums, just snipe at each other and be complete assholes and argue about everything. But it was cool because you knew who you were arguing with, right? The problem is, and by the way, this is actually something that I'm, I'm amazed. If you're out there and you were back in this era, I'm talking about 2009, 2010, do yourself a favor and scrub your account right now. I don't have to, because luckily I never said any slurs or anything like that, but just scrub your account now, because you don't know what you said in 2011, that, you, that the time was acceptable, that you will be wrecked if you now work for a Fortune 500 company. It'll be over for you if they find this tweet. So what I'll say is, like, we were still, like, in our own little pond back then. And we thought the pond was massive, because it was tiny. It was a little pod, actually. The problem now is the pond flew out into the whole ocean. And you know what? There's fucking sharks in there, mate. And you can't just be around there bleeding any old way, you know, like you'd be in trouble. So what I would say is like, I still to this day don't think I've got like a complete grasp on Twitter and social media because I actually don't think anyone does. It's like a game that never ends. It's like trying to be the best in a game, like League of Legends. You can't just go, well, I'm the best now. I can stop improving. Like, no, there's another guy coming after you. And, and they make more, it different he, tomorrow, right? Exactly. Like, and if you don't, and if you, if you misread the new matter, you're out of the game. It's also like sink or swim. So there's been a lot more in terms of like, sadly, Twitter actually became what apparently they initially designed it for, which was like to be a broadcast medium, you know, like you put thoughts out there and things like this, like, and you follow people as a result. And it's like your own little channel. Well, the problem is for us, it was like a social thing before. I actually often say now that in the modern day, social media is an Orwellian term. That's doublespeak, mate. It's anti-social media. If you post something, what happens is all the people who like it just either say like, yeah, nice, which doesn't mean anything to anyone, or they ignore it. What happens is the 
300 people in the world who fucking hate that you said that and want to destroy you come and say every nasty thing they can to you and hope you read it. That's anti-social media. Who the fuck would want that? So it's one of those things where, unfortunately, it brings such a great benefit, but you actually have to... You have to basically develop like a kind of discipline to not let the other part destroy you. Because unfortunately, I've seen a lot of people in esports. I think that's the thing that grinds them down the most is they're reading all the replies. Because when you had 100 followers, you were trained to, oh my God, I got a reply. You can even have notifications. Mate, I wouldn't even turn that on now. My phone would be fucking vibrate up the wall, wouldn't it? Like, mate, if I just tweet something about a Brazilian team right now, you can imagine the barrage. Of, half of it's in Portuguese. I don't even know it. <laughs> There's another pro tip, by the way. If anyone from another country flames you, they have a button that says translate by Bing. Why would you ever press that? That's like saying, shove all the dicks into my face. Like, why would you click it? It's like, that ain't for you, mate. Just leave that. It's another language. It's flaming you. It's a good thing you don't know what that's saying. It's a good thing. <laughs> that's a kind, that's a blessing. It's a mercy kill. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, side note, after, after the whole on gamers thing, um, I wasn't allowed to comment in public. That was like part of like, you sure. know, like survival. Um, yeah. So no matter what was said, I, I just boom. So I was like sitting there looking at Twitter, all the hate coming in. And I was like, okay, I don't want to deal with this. So I just like uninstalled the client. Felt a little shaky for about you know a couple of days because I was getting like like some level of like social disinteraction that I was expecting in this sure. passive uh, you know intake. And uh, I haven't really been on Twitter since, and I've really enjoyed it. Like I feel like I get. So much more done. I, I have also completely shot myself in the face now, you know, I'm starting yes. to publish content and, and now I have to also develop that platform from literally zero, right? Um, but holy cow, it's been awesome for my life as Kim Rom not yes. to be on social media. It's been beautiful. Now I have to change it and, and that's, I'm happy to do that also because I would like to do this thing and make it work. But man, these few years without really sort of like been a few times I logged into Twitter, like, you know, I don't know. And every day felt sort of like, it was like, you know, Groundhog Day that is sort of like repeating itself after seven months where, oh, you're also angry today about a thing that some guy said. Yeah. <laughs> Man, people sometimes like, you know, the phrase like necro or threads. People sometimes find the old tweet and get mad at it. It's like, you know, it's like five years ago, the fuck are you talking? I often think that's also the worst thing about Twitter is Twitter was presented to you as disposable media. Whatever you say today, no one sees it tomorrow, yeah. except because it's all archived there. People now, basically, it, it'd be the equivalent of if we just put uh, microphones in all the pubs and recorded everything everyone was saying, didn't say anything, and everyone thought, this is fine, you know? And then 10 years down the line said, let's play back some of those recordings. Like, you'd ruin the whole fabric of society. Yes. You would literally tear apart. Because, for example, the guy who's a politician in public, he'd have said all the crazy shit in private, wouldn't he? Because he thought it was private then. So that's definitely an area where, like, yes. your, your brain has to, like, readapt to it. You have to completely program how you think. And we live in a in a world where you know we've we've reached you know this pinnacle of civilization where we've agreed on all the social more or less agreed on the social norms around us, right? But that's also a world that opened up in just ten years. Right? Ten years ago, there was no social media. There was no this this thing didn't exist. This concept didn't exist. Uh, ten years before that, no one had no more than about thirty percent of the world had internet, right? So in just two decades, we have gone also gone from as a species understanding each other. And trust me, some of the things that were said in a Danish company with a young Kim Rom, <laughs> holy cow, man. <laughs> I would like... There'd be hashtags and everything. I'd be yeah. to burn alive, like. <laughs> yes, yeah. Well, one of the funny things is, the area that still has only just started to catch up to, twi to social media, it's bizarre, is politics. Because I still see politicians to this day, mate, who on camera in front of like, you know, 100 people, say something and think they can get away with a lie. And it's like, dude, everyone in the world is now Googling that. Like, we know that it's wrong. Like, you, uh, well, the whole point is, that's also, by the way, a key thing about social media, I would make a distinction that people don't understand who've never been big, is think about the way the president talks to a crowd. If you talk to one person that way, they'd walk away, it'd be condescending as fuck. Like, and now I'm gonna tell you now. It's like, but that's the thing you have to learn. You're addressing the crowd. You're not talking to one person. So social media, social is like, yeah, this is who I am, you know, let's get to know each other. That you can, If you talk to one person in that way and then everyone that way, it's going to be so misaligned. It would be the equivalent of like taking the banter you have in the pub and talking to your grandma that way. You're going to very quickly find out that's not acceptable, but it is in another context. Yeah. The problem here is online, what we had to learn is the sad, like lowest common denominator thing. Like here's the rules. And if you ever step outside these bounds, yeah, these people will be cool with it. But everyone who isn't cool with it, bizarrely, can't just go, that's not for me. They are compelled to destroy it. You are a heretic. Yes, sir. And, uh, and, and to chime in, <laughs> I always have an opinion about this thing that you're discussing. And I'm over here, like, 
Then it's it's funny somebody you didn't know. That's always jarring, isn't it? You're having a conversation with like Sir Scoots and something, and then some guy you don't know comes in. He goes, "Well, actually, I've always thought this," and you're like, "Who, who the fuck are you?" <laughs> This is so bizarre. Again, that's anti-social, mate. Imagine in a pub that. I'm having a conversation with you. Yeah, thinking my wife is. And then some guy leans in. I reckon you should just have a threesome. What the? Who, the, who is that guy? Get him out of here. Like, you would never let that happen with any social media. Yeah. I, uh, I, I realized in, what, I think 2011 or something, that I mostly said stupid things online. So I actually installed a Twitter script that, in, that uh, deleted all my tweets after 30 days. Good it's idea. Still running to this day. Like. <laughs> my Twitter accounts look really weird, like, one tweet in like 11 years or something. <laughs> well, that's the other thing as well, isn't it? Like, what's funny is this part of the problem with Twitter as well is that all the users who just have a very small account, they don't get feedback and they only give feedback. They don't know what it's like. And so as a result, what you get is, like you're saying there, someone says something stupid. Like, let's face it, Twitter should be for hot takes. It should be for like, something just happened. Here's my opinion from my brain now. And you know what could be so wrong that in an hour I might go, fuck was I thinking saying that? But the problem is, by the way, even if you apologize, you take it down, it doesn't matter, it's forever now. People will treat that like you, like that tweet that you just clicked was your manifesto to the world that you want, you know, a thousand years from now, people to study. And ignore. Exactly. So like every stupid thing you said, well, what's sad is the pleb fan who doesn't make the comment, he thinks, well, I would never say that. So like, you don't know what you'd say. I always say this. Morality is just a set of cool ideas that you've never tested. You don't know what you'd do in a, in a someone murdered your family member. You don't know what happened if something you were accused of a crime. You only know when you're there. Everyone before that, well, of course I would never do X, Y, and Z. You don't know, mate. Those of us who've been through the fire know you actually find out you know almost nothing about yourself in those contexts. You have to learn from scratch, unfortunately. It's also a very learning experience, but holy cow, like you can feel naked when you're standing in it, right? Of course, um, yeah. Let me just pull up my um, uh, my notes here. Oh, yeah. Okay, so it's a couple of like basic things, but um, looking back, 2001 till today, what would you say were the things in your career that you are the most proud of? Um, well, the thing is, like, I am someone, it's bizarre, because obviously, if you call yourself the historian, you'd think that, like, it would all be like, oh, well, I did this, that, and the other, but I've, I always do try to be like, as soon as I've done something, it's like, the next thing has to be good or better. So it doesn't matter if you do the, that's the one thing actually I've always thought some of my peers, that's what held them back, is they really do think once they file that amazing piece they do, it's like, right, well, I can just chill for a few weeks now. It's like, well, no, that, remember, everyone's only going to see that for one day. That's one day in your life, mate. Like, if you want to be sick, I really believe that, like, philosophy, it's like a famous quote, I think that might have been misattributed to, like, Aristotle or something, where it's like, excellence is not a, it's not like an action, it's a habit. It's the idea. It's like, unless you're excellent every day, you weren't excellent. You had one day you were excellent. Like, you just fluked it. If you were really sick, you better do it every day. And the standard better be rising as well. So I would actually say the thing I'm probably most proud of is just that through doing my own work and living my life online, amazingly, in front of everyone, I was able to figure out who I am and who I wanted to be. And so I was able to figure things out. Like, I, I actually did really sit down once. This was actually not that long ago. It was maybe, it was maybe around the on gamers time. And I thought to myself, what would be the, what would, how would you describe, like, you know, when they say, describe yourself in three words and everyone just picks just some garbage, funny, kind, or something, just the worst words ever. Like every, that's the most generic terminology ever. But what I tried to do was think for real, like what words would I want to describe me? That is what I want to become. Mm -hmm. So I thought, right, first of all, I want to be productive. I want to be the person who, you know what? It doesn't matter if you don't think my articles are the best. No one does as many as me. So if mine are the third best, but I do the most, I think I win on that, mate. Like, you know, because I always tell people, you know what? You can go ahead, put your best article against mine. Okay, deal. We'll judge who wins that one. Put your second best. You can see where I'm going here. Once we get to about five, I'll just win all the rest. Right? You, so you get you win three rounds, I'll win the next 20. I think I'll win 20 to three there, mate. Like, that's the way the, the real world works. So there's one. I wanted to be very productive. And that was no small feat, by the way, because especially early in my career, as part of being an antisocial person, where I didn't know how to socialize, I used to do that thing where the way you protect your ego is you go, that's because that's for losers. People are just fake, you know, and they're just like, they're selling a load of like bullshit. I'm the guy where it's just because I'm so good at my job, you know, and in fact, in some mad way, if people don't like me, that means that like, I must be so sick at my job that I still have a job even though they don't like me, which is a very fucked up way to think because actually, obviously everyone wants to be liked on some level, right? And to do good work. So what I actually realized was one of the things I needed to do 
was I had to develop work ethic because at the time I could coast a bit. I could do things very easily. Like people don't realize this. Like if you can go back and look at those early interviews, they're not going to look great, I have no doubt. But I bet there's some questions in that. Here's the problem. You won't know the reference. If you know how bad the interviews back then were, people were pasting an IRC log with all the fucking smileys and everything in. Like I was asking real questions even then. So what I learned eventually was if you work as hard as you can, well, then they can judge all the rest of it, but you will be satisfied. You will know that you did your best. Like you didn't leave anything on the table. There was no what if of like, oh, if I'd have done that there. So then the other things were, I mean, it'll start, many people might think this is ridiculous because they think when I make banter, I'm lying or whatever. But I tried, I wanted integrity to be one. I wanted it to be that I'm the person where it's not that I'll just say anything. Like, because then that is actually quite antisocial to just blur anything out. But the idea is if I think something's meaningful, if I think something is important to say, then even though actually this has cost me heavily in my career, I'll be the one guy who says it. So I'll give you a quick example. I won't go into the details. But if someone says something that is a word that's a very controversial word, and everyone on the internet does that classic thing like we were alluding to, where even though in private they all say the word, or they've all heard people say the word, or they all know, well, he's not really saying it in the most extreme version, they go, right, I'm going to take the most uncharitable reading of this possible. We're all agreeing to do that, right? And then we're all going to gaslight him that he only could have meant that because he's the worst person ever. We're all agreeing. When that would happen, I'm not even involved, but I would think, I'm not just going to stand by while this happens. I'm going to be the person who says there are other meanings to saying these things. Maybe that person, let's give him the benefit of the doubt. Let's ask who he was talking to. Let's ask about context. And obviously, context is the anathema of that kind of outrage. But you can't be as mad if you know the context. If you knew where that guy was coming from, even you, who I, whoever you are, you'd start to go, even if I hate him, I sort of see like, you know, what he meant by that. Whatever. If you can remove all the personality and just hate the comment, you, you go wild. So integrity was another one. And then just obviously try to be the best. That that was obviously very debatable because subjective, isn't it? Yeah. But you have three times now won an award for literally being the best guy. Um, <clears throat> so my question on that one is, what is the what is the emotional impact for you to become journalist of the year? You gave a epic acceptance speech. That was I, by far the best one I think I've ever seen for <laughs> anyone winning an award. Um, and I will get to that right after this, but like. As, as, as a human being, Duncan Shields, like, how, how does that feel? Um, the problem with this part is, right, everyone wants me to be an American sports star and be like, I worked my whole life for this, you know, and like my family growing up and it meant so much, you know, just I always dreamed of that award, like it's a child of dream. Like, the problem is, right, part of the reason I think I'm able to be quite blunt and quite... Um, I'd say precise, other people would say rude, in terms of how I like say things and analyze things is, like I get sentimental about some things, but I don't about some of the things like that. Because actually one of the other things is, I always wanted, like my guiding touchstone in my whole career is that I have to feel like this was a good piece. And if I feel like it was a good piece, I actually don't give a fuck what anyone else thinks. Like I do in terms of I need the hits to make the money, but that's it. Like as long as it makes, the, by the way, that's why in the modern day, I'm one of the only journalists I'm aware of who can put out an opinion piece where the 300 comments are like, I fucking hate this, it's shit. But the piece does so well in terms of hits that the fan doesn't realize mate, a hater's click and a lover's click is the same click. Like, I'll, I'll take all the clicks. Like, at the end of the day, what's that? Oh, they all hit. It's like, imagine me calling my accountant. Oh, they all hate me, mate. That's weird. All the money's in the account. Oh, well, see you then. Like, you know, who cares? Like, in that scenario. So, yeah, I would say that that's one of the bizarre things. Is like, <laughs> well, it sounds mad, but I always thought I was the best, mate. I think I should have 19 of these awards for every year. And maybe if I, you know, maybe if I was kind, there was one year that, you know, can't, I can have one or something, you know, I don't know. But so as a result, part of the reason, if you notice in that speech, I even, I even put a little dig in on ESL when they used to do awards. I say, you know, it's not like the desert used to give them all the cronies. I, I thought to myself, if you win an award, you use that moment to, in some sense, by the way, downplay the concept that awards mean that much. Yes. They don't. You know, like the, the, we all know the best movie doesn't win the Oscar. It doesn't mean it wasn't the best movie. Of course it was. So I don't take it entirely to heart. But the thing that actually did surprise me, though, because like I say, I wouldn't normally get that sentimental about that sort of thing, is just I was amazed how much other people thought it meant. Like they all thought it was the validation of my career. And then there was people, you know, outside of esports telling me like, oh, congrats you know you always worked for that and so even though i didn't really share the sentiment as much it was cool like that was kind of a cool experience actually because what i realized at that point in time was like how many people care about esports sort of yeah, yeah absolutely um so between i'm just grabbing here but like you know in 2012 and 2013 it was sort of like um 
you know, uh, websites that did community votes where you won, I wouldn't say like the popular vote necessarily, but like you know, your body of work was definitely acknowledged, but directly by the community. I have no fucking clue what goes into like the esports awards thing that, that, um, uh, do they mean different things to you? Um, well, the thing is actually, I, I for different, obviously not for that award, but for other awards, I'm on the panel for that. And I'm actually one of the people who's helped them a lot because actually one of the sad things about like awards that don't immediately come from the community. This is why all the people who think like the Overwatch League, the dumbest thing about the Overwatch League is they think that if they go and get all the big NFL owners, that they can sort of leave esports with them and make their own esport and have a great thing. They don't understand it wasn't getting the aliens to come down to us. It was building a sp spacecraft and going up to them. They can never do what we do. They aren't in the scene. They're not authentic. And so as a result, yeah, it's the case that like, it, oh, sorry, I forgot the point. What were we talking about there? <laughs> uh, well, specifically about Overwatch being, being, being stupid. No, what was the point before that? No, that's I, what I lost in my digression. I Let me think, wait a second. What was it about? Oh, it's whether or not like the award meant as much. So basically, one of the reasons I was part of that award is because I didn't want them to get a guy who's a famous guy in gaming and then tell him, oh, pick out the CS Go winner. And it's like, you know, he only works at StarCraft 2, right? Like he's not going to, first of all, in the in the general one, he's going to work for the fucking StarCraft 2 guy. And then secondly, I don't want this guy picking the couch. Like, I only didn't even watch it. So first of all, I was, I helped them, you know, source people who actually were experts in the game. So to be fair, that is like your peers voting you in. So that's actually pretty cool in that sense. And I, and I didn't know I was going to win that award, by the way. So I, w I will say, obviously, as it gets bigger, it will head towards things like the Oscars, which at that point in time, the people in the industry, you like it if you win. If you don't, you just complain about it. Like, that's all bullshit and it's all politics. And like, that is what it's going to become because that's what's going to be when it's I will agree. There's something if the community vote, yeah, that has a special quality to it still. Yeah. Certainly. Um, one of the... Uh often uh one of the ways i often see criticism towards you being sort of started is uh, is from this notion that now we are huge esports is a big thing yeah. it's a billion dollar industry so there's a certain level of um, of professionalism that's what they call it that yes. has to be applied to how we behave and how we say things right so i can't say fuck as many times as i would like to say fuck, yep. for instance um so fuck that because and here's how i say it this entire culture from from day one has existed because we click ass, because we shoot people in the head, because we humiliate them in games, because we own them, like whatever it is, right? It's, a, it's, it's based on, on, a, on, on mental competition that's about destroying your opponent. Arguably, you know, we have a sport that's centered around planting bombs <laughs> and yep. shooting people in the head. <laughs> if you can't say that and verbally acknowledge that, you shouldn't be in esports, you shouldn't be covering it, in my opinion. Like, this is not yes. sports, yep. this is something else. This is new. Dude, that's the thing that kills me. And I have to say, unfortunately, this is where Riot Games, so actually, I'm not that down on this company. They've done a lot of bad things, but they've also done some things that, you know, they were just misguided, and some of them were positive, they just didn't do them that well. One of the things I have to say that they did badly is because they had such of a casual base and they had so many kids playing. And if you even look at the game, it's all cutesy designs. So they're trying to play in that wheelhouse. They thought esports was supposed to be like a Disney product and it's supposed to be family friendly. Yes. Whereas, as you're saying here, when you come from Quake, remember, John Romero made it so that in Quake, it doesn't say you killed him with a rocket. It says he rode your rocket as though you'd fucked him up the arse. Like, that's, the whole point is that's not politically correct. That, it's explicitly not supposed to be. And so what people never understood, this is what I've always thought has been missed, is if you try to make it Disney, I don't think it'll ever be as big as it can be. It's the UFC. You market it as that. It's not, hey, can we guys come and join you and follow your rules? Do you want to join us? We're fucking sick. If you want to join us, step in the cage, mate, and come to our world. And we're shit talking here. We're doing all well. So like, I'll give you an example. In when they first started to do the proper streams with like analysts and a, a desk, you know, like a proper sports setup, not just you know red eye on his own in the corner with a mic talking for nineteen hours straight doing all five games at the event. You know, when it became sort of professional, people did the same thing. If you remember, the first ever major was like a month before I joined on games. It was DreamHack Winter 2013. And this was where I famously, DreamHack, because they, they came from the grassroots, they told us in the email, listen, we don't have a dress code. Just wear whatever makes you feel comfortable. So infamously, I came and I said, fuck it. And I wore a Lakers jersey and I wore a Penguins jersey and I wore like a USSR hockey jersey. And everyone in the industry fucking flamed me and said I was unprofessional, including other commentators. Now, what is insane about this, right, is for the next few years to get those jobs 
I had to dress in a suit and figure out my look and get smart. Now, to this day, if you go into CSGO, the number one host in the world, right up until the final, comes in like baggy sweatpants and like rap gear and stuff, and nobody bats an eyelid. They think it's cool. I was actually ahead of the game on that one. We finally figured out it's our vibe. Not you know, We're not trying to be the NFL on Sunday in a suit like looking really professional. We're not from the 1950s. Yeah. When I, um, when I uh, started getting promoted at Seal Series and... <clears throat> Didn't change a thing. I would still go to these meetings, negotiate, but I would show up in baggy pants or shorts and no shoes. <laughs> like, um, I got a lot of comments around that. But you're exactly right because you know what? Four years later, ah, yeah, that's uh, the esports guy. La, 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 right? It's become part of your branding that you were like, outrageous and didn't necessarily conform to whatever form uh, norm that, that was around you, right? Um, and that's what I. That's why I'm still here. I would argue, like esports still has this level of like, yeah, it's a, it's a thing. No one owns sure. it anymore, which is also a nice thing. Right? Hopefully not at least. Um, but you can be you in it. It's one of the few places where I feel like, you know, you, you're just do, if you just do it well enough, you're allowed to be you. We have one of the only jobs, mate, that machines won't replace. <laughs> They'll never make a machine that's as much of an arsehole as me. You'll never do it. You couldn't do it. Yeah, I, I, machine learning wouldn't be able to, because for a start off, machine learning would try to do it really well. You have to make a lot of mistakes to be like me. <laughs> it's all those, remember, it's all those flaws that make a person interesting. I, if I actually didn't make a, a misstep every now and then, imagine how unbearable I'd be. My ego would be out of control. It, it was also why, you know, when all this stuff happened, but don't give me I understood where you were and what was happening, and I wish you were maybe a step a little off the gas in terms of like the social influence, sure. but I understood what you were doing because um, I, had, I had done the same thing in Denmark when I was building a website there in eSports. There wasn't enough stuff to write about, so I made myself part of the product lineup. And exactly. it worked phenomenally well. Um, yes. So, so you know, kudos to you. Like. Yeah, that's why actually, mate, what I often say when people ask me, like, you know, my techniques or whatever, I tell them, listen, I'll t I'll, I, I, I actually don't believe in secrets, by the way, in terms of, like, trade secrets. I'll tell anyone who asks me, obviously not a random person, another journalist, if they ask me, how do you do your article or whatever, I tell them all the secrets because they're not secrets for them. They're only secrets for me. I, I know how they work. And so, for example, the, what I always tell people is, I might not have written the best article, but I wrote the best foreign article anyone's ever written. And no one else, anyone else is going to be a second rate for it. So as long as foreign's the brand that people like, I'm always going to be number one in that sense, you know. Yeah. It's actually a very unique way of thinking, but it's, it's the way you have to think. And also, another thing I actually did was, I don't know if you know the guy who's in the field of economics. He's called Nicholas Nassim Taleb. He's a yeah, guy he's who's like a... He's a really interesting guy who actually discovered some concepts like, um, like for example, he, he invented the term black swan, which is where an event just happens that changes the entire industry out of nowhere. And just like a black swan is obviously just going to be born out of nowhere. All the rest of them are white. It's not like one's gradually born, it's just black out of nowhere. So what he invented a lot of these concepts, right, that are supposed to be in the finance world. But if you strip away the maths, the concept applies to life because obviously life's kind of like a free market. Life's got the elements of economics in it. So one of his concepts was called anti-fragile and the idea was it's where you have a brand that even the mistakes reinforce the strength of the brand it becomes stronger from that and i'll tell you right these may be famous last words maybe i'm dead and gone hanging off a street lamp in a, in a year from now mate in which case this will be a very somber interview that people watch I'll finally get I, this. <laughs> exactly well yeah there'll be a lot of hits on that video won't be a great comment section i can't lie but you know it whatever I'll go, I'll go out the way i lived no, here's the thing, though. What people don't realize is, so last year, I didn't even have any actual scandals. I never said anything outrageous, right? I just, it was just because of political correctness, I disagreed with the consensus, and then I got lumped in as though I'd said horrible things, right? So people who were from the mainstream, this is the first time it's ever happened, mainstream people wrote hit pieces about me. And what happened is, these guys are used to going into a field like games development, and they find a guy, and maybe he's been accused of like, oh, be sexist hiring practices, and they get all the dirt on this guy, and they're, while they're doing it, by the way, they're like little demons, they're like, oh, I'm going to fuck this whole world up, man, this is going to be great, or telling all his friends, oh, it's going to be amazing. And then when he publishes it, right, what he expects is the rest of the industry sees that and goes, this guy's a piece of shit, get him out of here. And what he didn't know when these people wrote these hit pieces was they came forwards to the gamers, to the esports people, and they said, you know this Thorin guy, five years ago, said all this stuff about Poland. And obviously, everyone in esports was like, yeah, I think we're fully aware of that. We, we talk about it every year ourselves. We, we don't like him for it. But he is fucking pretty good at those interviews, isn't he? And you know what? As much as like getting angry at him is fun, I do kind of like those 1,000 free videos he made in the last four years. So, yeah, you know, I'll be mad for a minute, but I, I will forgive him because I want the videos. So what they didn't know is, I, again, I can't guarantee it, but I think I've sort of 
graduate towards that. Like in a way, especially because I own all my mistakes, they just get built into the narrative. And so you can't then, for example, here's the thing people won't know. Like one of the things that initially really hurt my feelings about all that Poland shit is that what I never thought about is the context that people in Britain at that point in time, if you're someone Polish and you hear someone British talking shit about Poland, you're going to think, oh, it's about immigration, isn't it? This guy knows some guy who moved when the European Union started and he hates him because he's an immigrant. And that's, it's it's racism. It's some sort of like, they uh, never understood it. It was never about that. It was about the event, if you remember. Yeah, I just yeah. spun off a bunch of jokes that never landed, unfortunately. And also, here's a key thing. Look like shit on text. Go watch the video. Everyone's laughing. It's all, it's just edgy yeah, yeah. banter, isn't it? Well, here's the thing people didn't realize in that scenario is that, um, oh, fuck, what was I saying there? Let me think a second. Because I had a good point I was making there. Let me think. Oh, the thing that hurt me the most about that scenario was exactly the idea that people thought, like, I hated Polish people. Like, what people, here's the saddest thing about that, mate, is all the actual context I gave about Poland was told to me by the greatest Polish Counter-Strike and esports players of all time. Uh, that was their complaints about Poland. So it was the sort of thing that you complain about, but if the guy who's not in your city complains, you go, hey, fuck that guy, even though you're like, yeah, you know, it is shit in some ways. Fuck that guy. Hey, you know, you don't like the outsider saying it. You get defensive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so as a result, the point I'm making here is, obviously, initially, I thought, right, well, the key now is don't ever say the word Poland for the rest of your life. Don't ever bring it up. Don't ever... And then I learned, no, because then every time someone brings it up, it's a fresh wound. Yeah, so, what I did in, so what I did instead is, as part of my persona, I made that the banter. Like as a joke, for example, if I'm ever in a scenario and someone does something corrupt, and then I go... Polish name, of course. You know, as though, like, the joke is, like, I'm keeping it going. But in that way, I've taken the fangs out of it, especially because the other thing is, people didn't know my personality back then, so they didn't know what to judge. Now people know it. You might dislike it. You might think it's obnoxious. But you do know the jokes. And so as a result, in a weird way, I've been able to sort of make it so that those aren't weapons to be used against me. I also also think um, uh, this this political correctness has, uh, like... Esports is, uh, to me, also one of the last few places where um, it's not rule of, of, of cultural law anymore, uh, or yet, so I, I should say yet. You can still make mistakes, you can say, still, say, still say things to get you in trouble. It's usually not the hardcore esports enthusiast that comes after you, it's also like the, the, the riffraff around it. And um, the, the thing is, like, I've learned this, uh, it's like a relationship. You can't be in a relationship with someone and love all these things about this person and then be super fucking pissed about these things because they are not separate things that you can just like back and white. Yeah. They are all tied together. So for all the dumb things that we may say once in a while, yep. we can't say some of the smart things if we can't say them. That's how yes. it works, right? Like we, you can't get this if you don't get that. And, um, and if you only get one dumb thing for every nine smart things you get, that's not a bad ratio. Like, that's the ultimate thing, right, that people say. And the funny thing is, the only reference point I have for this is apparently this is what always happened to stand-up comedians, is when someone gets offended, right, what they would say is this classic line that means that you don't know anything about stand-up comedy and you're a consumer. You say, why can't you just tell jokes that everyone enjoys? It's like, that doesn't <laughs> exist. That does, you, know the, you know that I always say this to people, you know the basic me- mechanism of humor is there's three of us, there's me, you, and Bill. And I say to you, hey, in this way, Bill isn't like me and you, therefore we've got a bond. Ha ha, let's laugh at him. And it's just for fun. It's just a moment. Well, the problem with that is it's inherently mean. But the point is we're not Bill. So this moment's funny as fuck, isn't it? Yes. Now, listen, Bill can get his lines off on me. But if we ban that, we then can't have any comrade. We can't have any interesting comments. Because as you say, you never know what the genius comment is and what the stupidest comment ever is. The line is so thin. There was... Um, uh... The case we, we were discussing earlier, um, uh, what was it? Anyway, I, I saw a journalist, a games journalist, I think it was a, uh, oh yeah, VP um, uh, made a tweet, some social media manager at VP uh, made a tweet that was uh, the, the Dota 2 players uh, standing in front of the, um, um, a Mercedes and a chip sitting on the couch. Yes. Oh yeah. It was, well, a, it was um, a meme of a porn scene. And yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Thought, like, who's going to get to ride on the Mercedes? It was, a, it was a girl from a porn actress, obviously. Yes, it was a very edgy tweet. I read uh, a page article about some guy who has two daughters. Exactly. And how he wanted this guy to be fired, and he wanted to find him and crush him. And I'm like, yeah. like you really have nothing more that you care about than that this guy made this tweet picture. He, tell, he told a joke that misfired. That's basically what it is, yeah. at the core of it, right? And you want him to, get his, to lose his job 
and, and, and you know, ruin his life because that. Are you fucking nuts? Like, you, why are you here? You shouldn't be part of a civilization. Like, if that is what society gets to, where you know you do that, and now have his job. Yes. I mean, these are people's incomes that we're talking about. Well, this is actually uh, where also, like, basically, Twitter got the same problem that the tabloid media has, right? Because the ultimate hypocrisy of the tabloid media is to go, hey, world, you don't know about this really horrible thing. I'm going to tell you it. So I'm effectively, I'm the one transmitting the horrible thing to you. When you get really offended, though, I didn't do that. Attack this guy who could have never told you that information. Like, the comments I made on that podcast back then, a tiny StarCraft podcast, not even Counter-Strike, by the way, that it was watched by like a thousand people at the time, you know, I wasn't addressing the guy who's going to get offended over here who ne would never watch it. Just like I say with the example of giving the joke to your grandma. I could get any joke off the internet by that. Come on, grandma, what do you think? That's disgraceful. It's not really grandma. We mean like that all the time. Like, he's, he, he should be banned from polite society. It's like that, that sort of, we have the term in English, pearl clutching, because it's like everyone acts as though they're like a 20 star. Like, oh my gosh. <laughs> I would never say anything like that. It's like, I'd like to just be a fly on your wall after you have that conversation where your mate comes around. We'll see what you're talking about, shall we? Yeah. Come on, man. Yeah. Don't, it's like the famous saying, don't shit a shitter. Come on, we all know what's going on here. Yeah. This is fake outrage. Yeah, yeah it's outrage for the sake of, of, of almost like, you know, I don't know if it, it ties into it, but it feels like a, a, a social media have made us more passive in our interactions with others, like clicking a like button is now a meaningful investment of time to show your friendship to someone. Sure. <laughs> so as, as that is taken over, right, like the, as the passiveness has taken over, there's some of the um, actual engagement, engaging stuff that I think is missing. So uh, maybe that's one of those you know, mechanisms that can create this fake rage. <laughs> like, oh, ah, finally, I found the thing I can be angry about today. Whew. <laughs> no, dude, I think that actually is a, a real principle, though, because I think part of it is, okay, people don't know this, but you know the concept of a scapegoat. Right? People on, here's what's mad, because it's been used as a metaphor so long in humanity, people think it's just about, oh, you pick a person and they didn't do anything wrong, and you've just all scapegoated him, you've put all the blame on him. The actual concept comes from these like nomadic tribes in the desert, and what they would do is they would literally take a goat who obviously hasn't done anything wrong, it's a fucking goat, and they would take the goat and they would do this whole ritual where they'd like lead it through the town. Everyone would do like, you know that Game of Thrones part when Cersei walks through to the red keep and everyone's shame, shame. Everyone would do that. They'd all say like, fuck this goat, you piece of shit, you're the devil. And everyone would express all the negative energy and frustrations they had. And then they would drive the goat out into the desert. It's just a goat, remember? And obviously it would just die off there. And just as almost like a psych psychodrama, people would feel catharsis. They would feel like, ah, oh, I got rid of that all that pent up shit from all the you know all the little grinding down things of daily life i got rid of it well what that is what happens online because what happens what the very interesting factor is people think it's when you misphrase a tweet you can phrase a tweet perfectly mate they read into it whatever they want and so what happens is when you make a tweet on a certain comment this is why politics is so dangerous you make a tweet on a certain comment they're not replying to your comment they're taking like that political position and they're replying to that as a whole yeah. So if you say something about immigration, they'll reply as they would to the most evil guy ever who wants no one to be able to immigrate anywhere. And he thinks everyone of, his, of the races are evil or something, you know. So unfortunately, they don't know that they're doing that. That's the way they're, they're expressing that, like, thing that's built up. Because remember, when they watch the guy on the TV, they have no way of interacting with him. Yeah. This is like if they could, as the guy's talking, like, call him up and he's like, oh, sorry, second. And then they're like, you piece of shit, you're a liar. It's like, you can't do that in TV. You can do that on real life. And by the way, this is the other thing, like I said earlier, you've got to protect your mind because the sad thing is that some of the most powerful people in the world open up those notifications and get hurt feelings, mate. One of the funniest things I addressed, you know, when I gave the reference to the UFC, I'll tell you an example of a bubble being popped by the real world coming along. Think about what MMA fighters were like before the internet was big. They're the toughest guy in the gym, on the block. They're winning fight, fist fights over another man. They have the ultimate self-esteem, ego. No one's ever going to talk shit to this guy. Well, when they got online, when the UFC got big, there would be 12-year-old kids messaging them the day after their fight, like, hey, knock you the fuck out, loser. And they, these UFC fighters were losing their shit, dude. They were literally replying to them, like, where the fuck are you? Because no, obviously, like, it was, it was like such a, like, an alien world to them. They didn't know it. And I always say to people, if you really read, if you're a big time person on Twitter and you read all of your replies, that's like allowing a public phone box somewhere that goes directly into your brain that anyone for free can pick up and go, 
here's all the most horrible things in the world. And you're just going, oh, please. It's like, you, you've got, it's, it's an alien world. It really is. It's another world that we're living in. It's surreal. As I get older, I can, I can feel my brain changing, physically changing, um, impacting how I perceive reality and how fast I can respond to reality. Um, you know, um, I'm 43 years old now. The level of multitasking that's required for me to be good at Dota, for instance, uh, is very different than the level that's required to be good at, at Counter-Strike. Um, they're very different. Um, yeah. And you understand the, the, the depth <coughs> of League of Legends, obviously, and, and StarCraft, by the way. It feels like, um, to me, esports is becoming more like martial arts than it is coming, uh, becoming like a, a UFC, as an, as an example. Like, that, that's how I see it. And what I mean is, um, a high-level black belt martial artist um, will, <coughs> will say hippie shit like, Oh, I'm not fighting an opponent. I'm fighting myself. Sure. <laughs> uh, but what I look at, you know, every single time where I question myself after I fuck up in a game, it, the, the thought process I can retrace back is usually something where I'm like, okay, I know I got this guy if I just do this thing. And then Smart Kim, he's not really very smart, but Smart Kim will then somehow convince other Kim, <laughs> I, you can skip 1.3 milliseconds if you just do it this way instead. And you don't have to do this boring thing that you know how to do. Um, and you lose. <laughs> um, uh, what's your perspective on that? Like, do you see um, do you see a difference between the sort of like the the mental level or the thinking that's, that's required to be good at Counter Strike versus uh, Dota versus League of Legends? And do you think that's uh, that's a sign of something more to come, as in like games getting more complex? Uh. To me, that's why esports, it's, it's the reason why esports is still to this day a bunkum term. There's no such thing as esports. Like, I'm going to sponsor esports. That would be like if I said, I'm going to sponsor companies. It's like, well, which ones? Like, printer jet companies or soft drink companies? Because depending on which one it is, mate, you're going to make a lot more money or you're going to waste a lot more money. Like, that's the problem with packaging esports. But the reason why I actually think esports is how it is now is because look at how divergent the games are. Like, Fortnite is nothing like CSGO, is nothing like... League of Legends is nothing like StarCraft. All these games are so different enough from each other that they I actually think they all have different skill sets. And that's, in fact, one of the things I always used to have to explain to the Counter-Strike friends, uh, Quake friends, when I was playing Counter-Strike. Then I had to explain to the Counter-Strike people why not everyone who's playing League of Legends is a noob. Like, yeah, most of them are, but the best player is better at League of Legends than you are at CSGO, and that's, that means something. And what I had to explain to them, basically, is actually kind of like the martial arts analogy. It's like, if you're the best Taekwondo fighter in the world... Your kicks are fucking insane. But you know what? The Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu guy will wreck you if you go in and have a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu grappling match. But you know what? If it's a grappler, if it's a striker match, you'll light him up all day long. The point there is, is one better than the other? Yes. I'm definitely not going to make a false equivalence that like League of Legends is as skilled a game as Quake. It isn't. But it's a different skill set. Like This is what I used to say to the Counter-Strike guys, uh, to the Quake guys about Counter-Strike rather. Because remember, if you, if you would come from Quake, you could never sell someone Counter-Strike's good. They think it's all camping, camping behind boxes, Funnily enough, by the way, Carmack, who now has had to run many Counter Strike tournaments, yep. used to post on ES Reality all the time. He called it Camper Strike, and he really thought, because he didn't know the game enough, he thought Counter Strike was hiding behind a crate on D Dust with an MP5. It's like, Carmack, that means you spent five minutes playing the game, mate. You yeah. don't know what the fuck you're talking about. But, but what I used to tell these guys in Quake was here's the thing in Quake if you shoot the lightning gun, it's, a, it's like an uh, instant hit, it hits exactly where it goes. If you shoot a rocket launcher, it's a projectile. It goes there slowly and you have to time if it gets there. If you shoot the plasma box, it's somewhere in between the two, you know. you in, it, To be good at Quake, you have to have a really diverse skill set. If you're just really good at one thing, you won't be the best. If you're in Counter-Strike, all the aim in Counter-Strike is what's called hit scan. You just shoot, it instantly goes there. There's no projectile. Done. So as a result, to actually be the best aimer in Counter-Strike is harder than being the best aimer in Quake. Because it's one thing that you have to be the absolute best at. Like, everyone's doing the same thing, the firing. Not, all, not the gameplay yeah. aspects, but, like, the firing. So, actually, what I managed to convince some of these Quake people is, yeah, because this guy in Counter-Strike can't do the rocket launcher, he doesn't do jump stuff, he's not overall more skilled than you, but in his field, he's better than you in his field, mate. Like, when you fire the machine gun in Quake, you're doing the same as him, but you're doing it a tenth of the time. Yeah. So, yeah, you've got your skill set, he's got his, though. And to me, that's the thing. It's like every game you go into, 
you almost have to live this game and reprogram your brain to fit that game. That's why, if you notice, there are still to this day so few people who transition from one esport to a totally different one. It doesn't matter how good they are, mate. I saw people come into Quake uh, in Counter Strike who were godlike Quake players, and we. I used to tear these guys up in Counter Strike and just be and tell them, you know what? If you keep playing like this, you'll never be good. You don't, you're thinking this is Quake. It's a new game. You have to start at zero. Yeah, I will say it was. It was like this. This beautiful honeymoon period in what, 2000, 2000 uh, 2001, where the the the, the, the yeah, dynamics and movement of the games were actually similar enough. Um, yes, when it was quite arcadey. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. we used to play it the hit button quick before we would play Clan Wars Counter Strike <coughs> because you know you just had better aim in Counter Strike once you just you know had this headshot mod for like 15 minutes in in another game. Um, I don't know how 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 things have changed this. So far, and as a as a as a person, um, as a as a brand. As an individual, is not uh, it's so far from being a sellout. <laughs> in my personal view of what that word means, that I can't you know basically describe <coughs> it more and say that if sellout is here, everything and every interaction I've ever had with foreign is is roughly over here. So you know, uh, I know Alpha Draft was what one of the sponsors. I think you could sign after on, on Gamers. There's been Boomio, uh, whatever. I really enjoyed seeing you. If you like fantasy esports, then blah, 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 blah. I mean, you could almost like see the skin crawling on you or falling off as you were saying that. On the other hand, I see you saying roughly the same things about Patreon. Uh, you know, come here, you'll get this and this and this. And it feels a lot more like it's, uh, you know, the person that I know who's saying those things. How was that to get into? Like, that must have been, I can't imagine it. Sure. Well, the interesting evolution actually was when I did the alpha draft stuff at first, you know, they sent me some copy and they were, you know, please mention these things, etc. And I used to do it like, 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 obviously at the time, podcasts themselves has gotten big. So, you know, a lot of the podcasts, you know, it was like stamps.com and like roses yeah. that get delivered to your house. Or whatever. And in fact, if you listen to enough podcasts, you'd even hear the same sponsors and you'd hear the same copy. Like, you know, the comedian is reading it and then the sports guy is. And I even thought to myself when I heard that, that is whack because even though I love these guys' podcasts, and you know what? If I even liked the pro the product, maybe I'd be interested. But I don't want to hear the same thing every time. And so I initially made the same mistake. But for nine months, I did that. And then what I did is I switched it, and I decided, right, this is dumb because I'm not an, an infomercial. It's not like they've never heard of fantasy betting, and it's not like they don't know this site. They know that already. All I'm doing when I mention them is giving them exposure. I'm putting their brand next to my brand. So what I learned was, and it's actually quite a breakthrough a lot of people have never come to, is actually you don't want to mention any of the features. What I would do instead is I'd do all these skits. Like I'd do, like I had one where it was like a mad thing about how, like, you know, there's a secret passed down through the ages. There were monks who gathered in chambers to whisper it and some of them would be killed if they were fine. And at the end, it was just like, finally, you know, the word of the retic was whispered, alpha draft. It's like, when you listen to that, it's, I'm never going to do that again. It's a one-off. You go, what the fuck is this? At the end, you just say alpha draft. And by the way, if you're not into alpha draft, you get on with the video. If you might do some fantasy betting, you know what? I think you might remember alpha draft now more than you would if I'd done the infomercial. So what's funny is I basically, what, what you would think is selling out, but I actually did it the most authentic way. I came up with some fun shit. And another thing is I actually have never sold out in terms of integrity. People don't know this. So I have done literally now like hundreds of betting commercials. Go listen to them. You will never find a single one where the phrasing is that you will win. Mm. I've never said it ever. I would always mention like, you can win if you understand the odds or if you have talent for picking the game or I would say, or if you want to have fun and play the game. I would always be very serious with that. And you know what? It didn't affect the quality of the ad because I was creative in other aspects. Whereas, for example, one of my rivals, some of your old mates at hltv.org, one time I actually went at them publicly because they had a sponsor. That's, this sponsorship ad began like this on every video on their, on their site get rich fast. Oh. It was a bank company. And so I said publicly, you know, you're, you're literally like degenerates basically because you're literally telling the person and if it is a kid, you get rich fast. And they actually tried to come back at me, mate, and say, yeah, well, you do the same thing with like esports schools. I go, nah, I don't, mate. I don't do that. Like I never say that you get rich fast. I say that it's a skill game. And if you don't see that distinction, you don't know what selling out is. That's the point I would make, you know. I, I, I don't know. I think, I think you, you, uh, you get a, a very specific view and sort of like ethical barometer for these things if you come from community. If you've been a part of an online community for a long time, especially one where, you know, for the first decade there was arguably not enough money to feed everyone <laughs> and there wasn't always not enough entertainment value to also entertain everyone, I think you, uh, you developed a, a very fine taste for these sort of things like uh, when is something across the line and when is something not across the line. 
Same thing. Yes. Today. Eight years in sales service, I don't think we ever lied on it, like what, what a product we do. I think we you know, sometimes completely fucked up and like, here's our intent, what we're trying to do, and is this the McDonald's burger you got instead? Like, you know, but it, there was never any sort of like intentional misleading. And I think um, that contrast to, you know, in, in my, my case, it was like to the other company that was always announcing that they had the world's first mechanical keyboard, even though that, you know, la, 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 yes. la. <laughs> Even though, you know, there was one in South Korea in 2002 yeah. or whatever. Like, true, that's what they would be doing, yeah. But they're white people, they don't know that. Um, by the way, regarding dumb comments, my, my girlfriend is uh, part Jewish, some, something, and uh, she has a great saying. Every race has the right to be discriminated against. She tells the Course. best Jewish jokes. <laughs> yeah. You're, but again, you're part of the tribe, so apparently you're allowed to say all of things now that, that you know, fall outside of that. Yes, of course. Um, mm, mm, mm. one other, what is he at? Mm. Ah, yeah. Okay. Do, do, do. So one big one, I guess, um, if Valve hired you, um, to be a consultant on Counter-Strike, you're the guy now. Um, that wouldn't be hard, by the way. I've worked with them. <laughs> I, I know how disorganized oh, no, those teams are. Like, um, like different person three times in nine months. <laughs> um, so they hired you um, because they want to get you know ex expert knowledge on what the future of Counter Strike could and should be, and what would be the right thing to do for the community. What would you do different than the world we're living in, or what would you do more? Well, here's one of the saddest things: is I don't have to speculate. I already know what the best esports circuit can be. It's called the Dota 2 Pro Circuit. And you know who owns that game, don't you? Valve yeah. Software. But the problem is, because they're two wings of the same company, and they don't, the CS one doesn't want to copy the Dota one, everything that gets really good that Dota 2 does, that's like knowing you're not going to get that because you're the redheaded stepchild in the fucking attic. Like they don't get, you know, that's the beloved son, the favorite son, and we're, the, we're this kid in the attic. So unfortunately, I want a lot of the things they have in Dota. Like, I so badly want double elimination at the majors. Because yeah. when someone wins the international from the lower bracket, there is no better story that can exist. It's the best story in esports. Yep. In Counter-Strike, we just have basically only the upper bracket. So if you get knocked out in quarterfinals, which actually I think is what happened when Team Liquid won, and then they went all the way through the lower bracket in Dota 2 and won the international, that can't happen in CSGO. Yeah. You're just out of the tournament. Sorry, whoever gets through from the other side of the bracket, he wins the tournament. Another thing... I also would have a proper circuit like they have. Like they're the first ones that I've had what I think is a real sports circuit. Like what League of Legends does is, again, they dictated it from the top down. They said, right, there's this league. That's all you can play in. Play in this league. If you win that league, I'll let you go to this one big tournament. You get to play that. Maybe, or I'll tell you what, I'll add another tournament. There you go. Play all your life in the league and play in those two tournaments. Enjoy your career. What they did in Dota was, because they had the open circuit, they had a million tournaments, right? And all Valve did was, they didn't literally say, like, we're running all the tournaments. They said, right, here's what we'll do. You bid for each of them, and we'll give this major to Star Series, and give this one to whoever, DreamHack, and this one to this person. And all we'll do, basically, aside from provide some of the prize money, which helps, is we'll make a circuit. So it's like tennis. Yeah. So when you're, if you're a tennis player, people don't know this, sometimes if you're close to being world number one ranking, you can choose to go to a smaller tournament that doesn't have the most points, but there's not as many good players there, beat up a few people aren't that good, get close to it. There's a game to it, you know. And so the key thing I'm pointing out is you have the option of playing all these tournaments. You have the option of what tournaments you play. But if you want to be the best, you can attend all of them. You can attend some of them. You understand what they each mean. They all build into something. So the reason why it's genius in Dota 2 is the Dota Pro Circuit qualifies you to the international. Nobody's invited anymore. Now you get there from meritocracy, how good you were in the year. We don't have this in CS. So in CS, we still have some really good things, but a lot of them are like, they're 10 years behind Dota, you know, they're like back here. And sometimes like more recently, Valve has done some pretty cool changes in the majors. They've started to level up a bit, but that's one of the things I would say is like, mate, we're all over here just walking along. They've got the wheel. Can we just have the wheel? Like we don't have to invent something different. It works, just bring it over. Yeah. I, I'll be honest and say like, you know, I, 
uh, after uh, remember Cyber Man, like he he went on to to start uh, help start a uh, Team Secret, right? Yes, arguably right now at this moment might probably be the best Dota team in the world. Very good, yes. Um, in Level Ninety Nine, the company I did after together with uh, Sardan and Andrea, um, OG was the first project that we actually dived into, right? Sure. Um, when we were at the Frankfurt Major, sort of, I think it was first, yeah, the first Valve Major in Dota. Um, so we were there, I was meeting the team, and uh, fucking lower bracket first game. <laughs> and they won, right? They took it all the way up. I mean, they had goosebumps. That was, was almost the most Gosh. exciting esports. And I didn't even understand the game I was looking at. It was just colorful yes. and crisp, you know? Um, and I could be hooked. Now I have a religious experience every year for two weeks at the international. It's just Dota. That's the only thing I care about. And I get that experience as an esports fan for two decades without advertising. Without interruptions, you know, highest level of casters. I, 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 I think it's such an amazing product that comes out of the Dota scene compared to uh, to to what I was expecting. To be honest with you. So my next question would be. You have seen the you know there's a franchising model and, and a league structure. You know, League of Legends uh, has one. Uh, Overwatch League arguably is there too, right? And then you have like you know, the complete free for all that is like the, the circuit that is Dota two. And um, you probably already answered this, but like, do you think that Overwatch League and and so on, Call of Duty League are here now is coming, is the right direction to go in for esports, or do you think we would be better served as audience, as spectators, and as players if it was more like a Dota type open circuit thing? Uh, the main problem I see here is that people don't know there was a period in time, I'll just guess at what the year would be, because I know from like some of the League of Legends people, if let's say it was 2014. In 2014, you could run the best League of Legends team and you had a successful business on your hands. You were making money from the streamers, from the sponsors, you were even winning prize money. This was a good little business. It's not a massive business, it's a good business. The problem is, if you know anything about global economics in the 20th century, is the whole point of capitalism is to you move capital to where it can grow. So as a result, as soon as something proves to be profitable, People go, let's just scale that all the way up. Now, the problem with that is that's like going along and little Billy's making awesome lemonade on his lemonade stand. And you go, right, Billy, we're going to buy 700 factories in Vietnam. We're starting production tomorrow. I need a thousand gallons of the lemonade. Give me the secret batch. It's like, and I need, an R and, I need R&D to be working on like a, a cherry Coke flavor. It's like, Billy's going to burn out. He doesn't know what the fuck he's doing. He can sell the lemonade. So the problem I have is this, is... The lemonade stand worked. I know that works. And if you like the games, it was pretty cool even when it was small. I don't know if Billy's lemonade stand can be Coca-Cola. If it can't, then there's no happy bit where it goes up and goes back down. It goes up, it shoots for the stars, it doesn't land on the moon, it just fucking dies in outer space and everyone's done. Like The problem I have is this. At the moment, I get why they do the franchising model because they've pushed the investment into every game that now no one makes money. And instead it's about, let's all play a mad war of attrition to see who's alive in 10 years. And then whoever is alive gets to make a billion dollars. But until then, we're all gonna bleed loads of money. We're all gonna fuck each other the whole time. And at the end of it all, whoever's still left alive, he wins. Like it's the most fucked up version of capitalism I can ever think of because it's kind of how all those big companies that buy each other do actually do things in the world. The problem with it is, if we can't make the jump to the top, which is where it'll be profitable, then it will all have been a waste. It will all have been a vain. And unfortunately, we will have killed a scene that could have survived, that had a, a level of sustainability. The problem is, it was never, it, it, like, it has to be one or the other. It can't be like just twice as big a franchise. It has to be like the NFL, or you have to stay like we were before. We had to we were like snooker or something. We were very niche. People like it, like it. And you were never going to win $10 million for winning the world finals of snooker. But if you were the best, you got a pretty good living. If you were the 50th best, you didn't get the best living, but it's cool to be a snooker pro. You know, that's the two worlds we could have been in. And the reason why I make that distinction is, in the past, I would have said that's, that was actually the distinction of franchising versus the open circuit. But unfortunately, the open circuit has the same demands. So at the moment, the open circuit, as far as I can tell, is just the area where there's too many forces that cancel out monopolies and people taking over. So they, by the way, I can tell you right now, I could list teams and tournament organizers that will tell you in an interview, I love this circuit and how competitive it is. They desperately want a monopoly and to kill everyone else in the circuit and to declare victory and have all the money pumped in by all the massive... Of course, they look at the Overwatch League, they're having wet dreams about being like the Overwatch League, just controlling everything. So unfortunately, it probably is all going to go towards the franchising model eventually anyway. So if you're someone like me who enjoys the open circuit, just enjoy it for now. It might last forever. 
That's the worst news I've heard today. In um, so I, I'm not a particularly big fan of the Tears of Riot, and I've uh, gotten into skirmish with them a couple of times. Um, what I would say is, when they uh, when they booked the, the Staples Center in uh, in 2013, that was the moment. Like you know, from at the time I, would, I had just started the CBS Interactive. Uh, um, uh, arguably one of the bigger game media coverage divisions uh, in the US. Uh, I don't know, maybe 80 employees or something in, in that section. And none of them gave a flying fuck about Counter-Strike. Like, it was almost like, you know, spitting at me when they saw me on the, like, not even saying hi. That's how stepchild it was. And uh, Stable Center sells out in an hour. And it, it, it literally, it was like waking up to a new world. Like, um, all of a sudden people cared. All of a sudden, the salespeople were, oh, yeah, you're doing this thing now? Like, you know, all of a sudden, there was, like, a reason to believe. I call it the tipping point. Like, that was, that was the moment in my experience where uh, esports became a thing. That was, like, the, the big thing. That was LA. So we should be very happy and thankful for, like, for the things that Riot has done. But sure. I think we should also be, you know, realistic. Like, in, uh, what, in 2015, they broke all viewership records in esports with the World's events. If you look at the contracts and, and what they were paying, the, uh, what, the, what the players were being paid as part of their system, yep. that is the cheapest 200 content creators it's in the history enough. of mankind. Why yeah. none? I was thinking if anyone had done something like we did it on Gamers where they're getting this level of talent, and I was like, oh yeah, right, completely. Like, you know, they just hired the 200 best players and called them content creators yep. <laughs> and created a, a show around them. And that was exploitation. Like, like, no one really has, like, thought about it, and it took me a while to put these words on it that I'm putting now. But the perspective from Riot and the billions of dollars they're making and what they are spending yes. on esports, that was, that was exploitation of these, of these players. Um, the most fucked up thing Riot ever did was, even in interviews, they spoke like an abusive husband. Because what they used to say in interviews was, listen, I provide this esports for you. And you know what? I lose money doing it. And I do it for the love of the <laughs> players. I want the players to succeed. And so you know what? The, the implication being, by the way, don't be rude. I'm paying for all of this. So let me control everything. I'll decide everything here, even what you do in your team. Now, obviously, the reason it was an abusive relationship is they were losing money in the same way as when I pay for an advert, I pay the money. Oh, I, I lost money advertising for Coke. No, because I sold a billion pokes. I made loads of money. We all know it was an advert for the game. That Who the fuck would be playing League of Legends 10 years later with no esports? Nobody. Like, you even need the pro scene to make people want to play the champions that you was. You need it. It all, it's all turnover. It's all like a compost heap that keeps regenerating itself. So, yeah, they, they had a fucked up mentality with that whole thing. And by the way, the people who got it the worst is the, all the Korean players. There were some of the best players in Korea, who at the time were levels above in League of Legends, mate, some of them were making like 20k a year, when the best American player was making 120k a year, and he was half as good. And people thought that was cool. I thought that was fucked up, personally. Yeah, I, wasn't, I didn't think that was cool at all, actually. And in fact, yeah, if you look at how things are now, we're probably still not an appropriate level of compensation. I know they, they wouldn't believe that, but yeah, it's, it's, there's still a way to go on that. Because obviously we haven't had what every other sport had, unionization and then certain standards set and then people were willing to boycott. So th that's still miles away, unfortunately. It's also, so I have a, uh, my perspective on this, like, you, know, you have done these amazing pieces about you know, how you know, um, uh, a person can keep the winning mentality, can keep themselves as a champion, like the, the fucking effort it takes to be that for years in a row. Okay, so these are smart people. Um, they could also get job in Silicon Valley startups. They could also dedicate their job or their life to you know creating a thing that makes it slightly easier to book a taxi or whatever, right? And somehow end up with equity and millions of dollars for that. Um, and this this is the biggest problem I have with the franchising model right now. I don't see this the scenario where the League of Legends guy or the Overwatch player somehow ends up you know uh, winning five million dollars uh, this year for this amazing effort like og did in dota 2 right yeah. and for me that is that's sweat equity that is the retirement money you can get from investing so much of yourself right you you should be able to see this that is a trigger point here mate, for me because the reason it's a trigger point is basically we're going to get into a, a, just a tiny bit of politics because by the way i'm never going to go fully into politics i'll learn my on that one so a tiny bit of politics and all i'll say is this the most bizarre thing I had to encounter when I learned about American culture is in their culture, they celebrate ideas of it's about meritocracy. And, you know, that's why Bill Gates is a hero, right? He's the guy who figured out how to make the most money. And then it's up to him what he does with that. He earned that money, right? 
bizarrely, their sports are treated like a communist controlled economy where it's like everyone will be equal and it doesn't matter how good you are. That's just you were born with that. That's just an advantage. That's your privilege. And uh, you will receive this payment for your services and he will receive that payment. And it all became about, it's a very clever mechanism, just like with socialism. The reason socialism appeals to people is most people aren't Bill Gates. So if what socialism tells you is, let's fuck over Bill Gates and get some of his money. Obviously, everyone's going to go, I'm actually on board with that because I'm not Bill Gates. Like, well, if you do that to players, what they did is they said, because by the way, for a long time, I think it was up until two years ago, first prize at Worlds in League of Legends was $1 million. At the time in Dota, first prize was about $9 million. Now, the reason why that's insane is because if you add up what their stipend is and the salaries, the person who comes, who's the best in the world at League of Legends is nowhere near the earning of the person who's the best in Dota. But that's the problem. We, you and me might see that as a problem because we want a meritocracy. What Riot did was spin it the other way. Yeah, but the guy who's last place in Dota, he doesn't get much. Uh, excuse me, is he supposed to? Isn't it a fucking competition? If you come last in something, why would you get a nice share of the money? Well, congrats for that. So what they did basically was steal the money effectively from the guy who should... Faker, Faker's won Worlds three times. He's won less than OG won last year, winning their ETI once. What is that? That's yeah, fucked up. Yeah, so as a result, basically, it's not that the money wasn't there. You can calculate it all. The money was there. They took Faker's money and what he earned, and they gave it to the guy who came last place. They spread it out among everyone. And here's the thing. In society, you could make an argument for social because people need to live. People don't need to be bad pro gamers. People who are bad pro gamers need to get the fuck out of pro gaming. Mm. I'm here to celebrate greatness. Mm -hmm. uh, 100%. Like, one of those is it's beautiful to watch and has a lot of intricate details, and the other one, you know... I might as well be watching a YouTube clip of something else, right? Like, there's literally no difference. Um, there are 66 player millionaires in the world today who have accumulatively won more than $1 million. One of them plays League of Legends. The, the, the game that is being played by more people than all the other esports games together. Like, it makes yeah. absolutely zero sense. And, and, and I uh, understand I've heard that argument too, you know, about the, the, the poorest guy. But the reality is that, you know, if I take, and I did that, I take a, took an analysis of League of Legends and Dota, compared all the numbers to each other, um, there are still more people in, in Dota that made $15,000 a year. I've no doubt, yeah. yeah. Like hundreds more. <laughs> and well, that's, that's also the other flaw of, of, of League versus Dota, is that in Dota, they still also understand it's a global circuit. Like you all, all the best, it's like Counter-Strike, all the best teams go to the tournament and compete. If you're not a top 50 team in the world, sorry, you don't get to be a pro. Same way as if I'm, I've, I've actually looked at the economics of this. If you're like the 200th best tennis player, you don't make a very good living, mate, and you have to practice like a motherfucker. But that's so that Roger Federer makes, uh, you know, 100 million a year, or whatever, 30 million a year or something. Well, the problem is, League already, again, they always were coming top down. They weren't grassroots up, they were top down. And so they already wanted every region to be salaried, as though it was like football, and, you know, the Serie A, and there's the Liga. But the problem is they were taking the money that should have been only in La Liga and giving it to Serie A, and giving it to like, what is this shit? Like, again, you can't, you can't skip forwards in time. If, if it isn't there... Like, you can't just decide, oh, I'm going to artificially create it. Like, it won't work in that way. Um, in the same vein, uh, Overwatch League has chosen a franchising model that's based on cities. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I assume that's because that was the easiest sell to the sports people with all exactly. too much money that didn't know what else to do. Yeah. Um, because... I, so help me understand it. You, you, I, you're good friends with Monty. You're into Overwatch. Uh, I, I'm not. I'm also not a particularly big fan of, of the sure. company that makes it. Um, so help me understand it. Like because there is now, you know, imagine the team starts in Copenhagen. It's a new brand because the, dic the league dictates that it has to be a new brand. So exactly. it's a new brand with with. Already oh, shooting yourself in the foot. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so so as I see Overwatch League, right? It's like you pay twenty million dollars for a lottery ticket, where to win the lottery, you have to do, you have to build the lottery. You actually yeah. have to create the company that organizes the whole thing and distributes all the things and so on. You have to build a new brand in a new city, in a new game, <laughs> with new players coming there, appealing to a local base somehow, while also appealing to the, like, I'm a marketeer. I've been relatively successful in that exactly. field. I don't understand it. I don't, I can't make it work in my head. If I, I was a team org owner, I would say to Blizzard, I'm an org owner, not a fucking miracle worker. I was supposed to do that. What? So you can't do it. You can't make this a global league, but I'm supposed to do it individually. How does that make any sense? You're right, though. The reason they did it 
is because from day one, Overwatch League wasn't supposed to be for endemic esports people. It was supposed to be for the people whose own sport is failing to hop over to the new hot shit. And so, unfortunately, that's what appealed to them. Like, obviously, Robert Kraft of the Boston Uprising, in his brain, he's wrong, by the way, completely, and he's been wrecked on this. He probably thought, got to have that Boston spot and all the sponsors in Boston and all the fans of the Patriots. It's like, yeah, okay, let, let me see how many of the Patriots pay for a ticket to go see your fucking Overwatch team. Let me know about how Bob's Tires is going to sponsor your Overwatch team. It's not because the people watching aren't in fucking Boston, you moron. They can't go to Bob's Tires. That makes no sense because, again, think about the analogy I gave before. I apply it in every sense. Sports has a grassroots aspect. Because that's where it began. You ha- you, It was in that city. The players were in that city. The fans were in that city. And it grew up. Well, here's the mad thing. Think about, like, the average... I'll tell you, off the top of my head, I would guess that the average Manchester United fan isn't from Manchester talking like Liam Gallagher. He's in fucking India or China, and he has a Manchester United jersey on. That proves that it's the opposite. Geolocation was baby steps. Global or esports... And global sports is the future. That's the future. So it's the opposite model to me. And I don't think you can... You, here's the thing. You can come up like that and then expand it out. I don't think you can go down into it, though. You can't just, like, airdrop a team in and go, love this team. It's like, remember, this is a mad thing. Supposedly, one of the reasons, right, as to why baseball is dying out in America is because the most famous thing about baseball is that's how fathers bond with their sons. They play mm-hmm. catch in the yard, and you take your son to the game. Well, because of all the divorces, now, yeah. et cetera. Yeah, people... And there's other things to do. People don't do, do baseball anymore, right? So even traditional geolocation models don't really work. They're dying out. Like nowadays, baseball will succeed on its TV ratings if everyone in the world wants to watch baseball. If they don't, they're shit out of luck, no matter how great the guy in the New York franchise did. It doesn't matter. So I agree with you. To me, it's such an alien concept. It really is like trying to look into the past and copy them when we're the future. They're supposed to copy us. And then just touting it as like the next great thing to happen to esports somehow. Mad, isn't it? What I'm afraid of is that if if the Overwatch League fails, now I'm hearing good things about people in the league and they seem to be very happy about what's happening. I have no sure. idea. But if I look at the macro trends surrounding the league, then it is a $60 game that is released right after it comes out. Um, three new games come out on a free to play model that does a League versus Han model on the game, making it culturally not irrelevant. But not growing, right? So you, you can argue that from what we've seen so far, Overwatch League has peaked. It has some level of audience interest, and on that notion, it then has to compete against Fortnite, Apex, PUBG, um, arguably Counter Strike. Um, how can how can the Overwatch League develop over time? How can there come new fan bases in and get sucked into this game? Because you know, it's not the easiest game to watch if you have no idea no, what's going on, right? Yeah. No, that's part of the problem is that here's the sad thing. If they took their, if they had the Overwatch League model, but their game was League of Legends, they might have had a chance. They actually were doing some things that were ahead of Riot. Like Riot obviously was way behind on that shit. And in fact, for people who don't know, were spurred to do it themselves to stop every fucker going to the Overwatch League because no one was making money in League. So actually, if they'd have had the game that everyone played and everyone wants to watch, they might have had a shot. Even then, I think they might not make it because I don't know if League will make it. But... Overwatch, the problem is you had the model and you had the concept. The game wasn't there, though. And the game is literally the engine of the car. Like, if you don't have the good game, it doesn't matter how amazing you make. You could hold it in fucking Cowboy Stadium. You're not going to have 100,000 people watching it live. You're not going to have 10 million. Like, the, this is the dumbest thing about the Overwatch League is at the moment, they all use this mad sunken cost fallacy of like, well, the numbers are slightly better than what our worst case projections were. It's like, what kind of fucking <laughs> business model is that? <laughs> Because, by the way, if you ever go and read those Morgan Stanley reports, etc., what they listed as the as the as the base case should have been the bull case. They lied completely, and then they did that classic thing where you take a graph that's really this small and you extend it. So there's a famous XCD comic that's like this, where a guy's explaining on a whiteboard to a, a woman like, "You've just gotten married, so that means that in 2027 you'll have 10,000 husbands." Because the logic is, she got married this in one year. If you expand it, well, obviously she's gonna have one husband ever. So here's the question for anyone in Overwatch: If you're all smarter than me, answer this. If the viewership's only at this level now, and we're on year two. What reason is there that the viewership will ever double, triple? Because by the way, to get to where it needs to be, it probably has to be 10 times more, if not more. So they need a miracle. And at the moment, they don't have any like 
real chart to get there. They're going, well, if we do things like sports, do we get there? It's like, why are you asking me? You're the one with the plan. <laughs> I mean, you can keep hiring sports executives that made something amazing in sports. I really think this is a different different universe. That's what CGS tried, mate, back in the day. They had a guy who'd like produce the NFL. the city model. Like... <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It didn't work, did it? <laughs> uh, uh, what I'm afraid of, to be honest with you, is actually that when Overwatch League fails, and I'm without being an expert in what's happening in the league and if they're really doing this amazing product, I can only predict that it was failed based on the macroeconomics and uh, numbers that I'm looking at. And when it does, it will be a cataclysmic failure. In the same way that you could argue that Stable Center was sort of like a big bang event that did a lot of the things that enable us sure. to sit here. I'm fucking afraid that when Overwatch League fails, it will be so many rich sports people, it will be so many burned NBA stars or whatever that has invested that, you know, it will take a decade or a half a decade or more to recover for the industry. Simply just, you know, some money will start coming in, then maybe that's a good idea. But it also means the smart money or, you know, some of the good money stops yes. to, to entrepreneurs for building things, right? And that is the biggest thing I'm afraid of with Overwatch League. It is actually that Blizzard can once again fuck over the entire ecosystem. Yes. Well, the saddest thing is, like, that's the part that I also think is the disconnect. People see, like, an NFL owner comes in and they think, holy fuck, the big guys are here with all the money. That's not, no, Jeff Bezos is the big guy. Let me know when Jeff Bezos decides to buy one of those or when Google decide to buy a team because that's when they'll know there's money in it. They've looked, you don't think they're not looking at this shit. They invest in shit all the time. They even have people who invest in stuff for them. The reason why they're not investing in the Overwatch League, etc., is the monetization model isn't there. Like, there's a famous thing, right, where one of the earliest uh, sports people to be interested in esports investment-wise was Mark Cuban, the owner of the Dallas uh, Mavericks, the NBA team, right? And what happened was he was really early, and he came to these teams, and he said to them, it's pretty cool, actually. I come from the tech world. I like gaming. I can see how this could blow up. So if I buy a team, how do I make money? And then they were like, right, well, you get sponsors, and uh, you could sell some jerseys, like some, you know, you win prize money. And then he was like, wait a minute. I, I, I don't even get a franchise if I buy in. Like, like, my team can get relegated and I'm out. Like, I, all the money I invested is gone. And he, he, they were like, well, yeah. And he's like, wait a minute. And you know, in traditional sports, like sponsorships, the tiny fraction of the pie, it's like, you know, broadcast rights, merchandise. It's like all oh, this stuff, like, you know, secondary content or whatever. It's like, You've got the tiny part of the pie. Like, why would I invest all my money into that? It's like, until that model's there, which, okay, franchising is a step towards that, but you've got all the others to go. Where's the broadcast rights for 100 million? That's what makes the NFL fucking sick. Where's the fan who spends $60 per person to watch the NFL or whatever? I'd, I'd imagine with how much free content there is, because by the way, all of the content to watch is free to this yeah. day. I'd imagine the average fan, or I, I don't know the number, I would guess it's in the low dollars. It's, it's going to be less than $10 each. So there's a lot of areas in which it doesn't, the numbers don't match up. And that's why, unfortunately, you have to use sophistry. You have to fudge the numbers. You have to be a fucking wizard with that Excel sheet and trick a guy who doesn't know any better. And, and, and even worse, this is why I think you don't look at the sports owner and think he's the genius. He bought into an established business that shares all the money, makes billions of billions. All he has to do is run his team well and do some of the marketing things on the side. He just does his part in the business. It's like what you said about the writers at GameSpot. This is like telling them, uh, you have to write the piece, gauge public opinion, market the piece, carefully craft the next piece so that people say, like, fuck, you know what, I'm doing your job as well. You are, that's the point. And so I, like, I actually think it, as much as a lot of money's come in, it's not the sort of magnet for all the clever investors that people try to make out. It's a lot of people, I think, just gambling. Yeah. Uh, Fair play to them if they want to do that, if they've got the money to spend. But I agree with you. If it tanks, it's going to it's gonna be like the, an air bomb going off. A lot of people weren't at the epicenter are going to get hit as well. Uh, so I'm, um, I'm, I'm closing a, my seat round right now for explain.com, um, which is the first project that I have worked on where I had a monetization model that's sort of like built into the native part of the concept. Every investor, I'm, I'm at 30 now, um, have said that, wow, this is the first time we've seen an esports thing that was designed to actually, you know, be sustainable. <laughs> oh, that's the thing I will about Overwatch League. They, no, they, uh, one <laughs> thing I'll give them credit is they sold these guys that it was a 10-year plan. They sold them, don't expect year two and year three. What they didn't tell them was, again, it was like the thing, it's like, it's like the woman who got married. It's like, listen, well, there'll be the other 9,000 husbands are coming in the next 15 years. Like, they're not, are they? That's the point. We only know how to get to this part. No one's figured that part out, otherwise we wouldn't need them. I heard a scary part of uh, an interview the other day with uh, one of the team owners, um, Hasbro, 
Uh, I forgot the name of his. Uh, Dallas Fuel. Uh, so new brand in the new league from from Hasbro. Uh, you know, an accomplished guy who knows how to build certain things. Uh, sure. Done great both as a player and as a business person. And he praised the league, like you know, like loved being in it, yeah. you know, being operating. And then he said something that was scary. Like, well, you know, remember that even if you, the game didn't sell so much, and even though that it's now being outcompeted by you know these newer titles, this is a company who knows how to do an annual release like Call of Duty. <laughs> like, and then c- congratulations with your twelve, the twenty million dollar investment and building this brand um, that will now every year get a new audience somehow and like turn into a Call of Duty model. I think that's all. That's the reason why, you know, out of the 66 millionaires in eSports, there's zero of them that played Call of Duty. <laughs> well, the irony is Call of Duty is the game that actually maximized marketing. The web, I learned actually a lot of things about YouTube from people like Hex from Optic, right? Because I used to say to them, you know your eSport makes no sense. The finals of the World Championship get 100,000 views, but your player's vlog gets 500,000 views. That doesn't actually add up, you know? And what that means is you maximize the marketing. But... That, that's why I say it's ironic. I, I, if I were them, I wouldn't even be mentioning Call of Duty because Call of Duty never got to CSGO numbers. It was selling a new game every year and it can't get as many views as CSGO and no one in China gives a fuck. But that's also one of the, you mentioned one of the amazing things about esports, right? I'm sitting here doing a webcam show with you who are arguably the, one of the masters of it. Um, I remember when, what, what was it, ESDN, that the news network thing that came yes. out. Of, one of the, so the billionaire investor, <laughs> first night, he's looking at it, He's like, I don't understand this. We have this production that costs, you know, eleven million dollars to put the studio up, and da, da, da. And there's a guy streaming while he's playing games. <laughs> yeah, that has you know, ten, like twenty that. times as many concurrent views as us. Why? And none of the people there could give him an answer. Like, so, so now we know why they closed, also. But like, that's amazing, right? Like, like how many things are are like that? Um, and I think this is my last question or the last topic I would like to cover. One of the things I've discovered or found in esports, compared to anything else that I've touched, including gaming, is that um, I meet more people in esports that has never had to deal with a shitty asshole of a boss, or had to do a, a job that they really hated doing, because you know there's the luggage will transition in, clicking a mouse all the time, and having competition and so on and so on and so on. The person that comes out of that. The well-being of that person and how awesome it is to hang out with that person and, and you know like the things that they can think of and like the, the overall mood I think is, is much better uh, you know than most of what society otherwise sort of like puts people through the cultural assembly line and turn them yeah. into right um, it's also in the, in the case of Dota it's one of the few things in life or in this world that we live in that truly rewards you for being smart Right? For True. being the smartest guy, the most creative guy, the best threats, whatever, like, you know, you're truly rewarded for being the smartest person on that stage. We didn't joke. <laughs> um, and I was trying to come up with other things where I truly believe that you're rewarded for being smart, not for being fast, you know, athletic, uh, strong. And that's, I think, is actually what esports is becoming. Like, I think it's becoming the smart man's game where, you know, the smartest guy, at least in some games, will be the guy who's rewarded. And I think it'll be really good for society because if there's anything I want my kids to look at, I want them to know that the smartest guy is rewarded. Not the prettiest one, not the most reality starish yes. one, not the blah, 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 bullshit. Like, be smart. You don't have to work hard, but work smart at least, right? Like, be smart. Well, what's great is what you're basically saying is the person who wins and succeeds has in, in like literally real value that you can put, it's tangible. It shows up somewhere. Life's nothing like that. Like what sucks about life is you're the smartest guy in your office, but you don't understand politics. And so the guy who you you ended up doing half the work for, he gets the promotion and you're stuck behind going, what's going on here? Or you're really good, but you don't know how to talk to the other people and they don't like you and they don't help you and they won't give you the stuff. What's great in esports is I know this. Like I was, I was good friends with the Swedish player Nanawa. Well, one of the things I loved about this was, if you know him as a person, he's a brilliant person. As a as a human to other humans, he, he's one of the most ridiculously mis- socially misaligned people I've ever met. Yeah. Like he could just go from like talking to someone to like saying the rudest thing ever to them. And he didn't get that. He just done that switch like yeah. that. But I here's agree. the key thing. In life, he would never make it in any corporate structure. He would literally be the guy. So he like, do you want fries with that? And then he'd go home and play StarCraft 2 for fun. 
Like in this game, it didn't matter that everyone in the venue wanted him to lose. If he beats your ass and you're the hero, you're that fucking player that everyone loves. Like you're EG Machine. EG Machine was garbage at StarCraft 2. He'd get his ass handed to him by Nano. I love that. Like not because I like people to be nasty or whatever. I like the idea that like the, there's not a vote at the end of the ATI tournament. Who should be the winner? No, the winner's the one who kicked everyone else out and took the trophy. He didn't get handed it. He fucking took that shit from the other guy. 